Welcome everybody. Um, it's nine o'clock. I'd like to call to order the teleconference meeting of the Santa Cruz Metropolitan Transit District for May 15th, 2020. And uh, before we begin, let me note that this meeting is being recorded. Um, and I'll ask the board secretary, Gina Pai, to please call the roll. Thank you. Dr. Matar. Here. Dr. Cafio Gomez. Here. Dr. Gonzalez. Here. Dr. Leopold. Here. Dr. Lind. Here. Dr. Matthews. She let us know she made the wait. Dr. McPherson. There he is. There he is. I You're see muted. him. Dr. Here. Okay. There okay. You go. Dr. Myers? Here. Dr. Pegler? Here. Dr. Rothwell? You have to unmute then to say here. Hold your space bar down. I got it. Thank I'm you. here. Dr. Rotkin? Here. Ex officio Director Henderson? Not here. Here. Oh, thank you. Ex officio Director Northcutt. Here. Okay. We have quorum. Additional, additional staff presence that we have online. I have obviously Alex, the CEO, Julie Sherman, General Counsel, Angela Aitken, CFO, Christina Milova, Acting Finance Deputy Director, myself. We will have John Ergo. We will have Pete Rasmussen, and we will have Ginger Drycar, a City of Santa Cruz representative. Is she not, is this not um, the person who works for the Regional Transportation I'm Commission? Sorry, yeah, not R not RTC, the city not the city. Yeah, RTC. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, before we move on, um, we were great at our last meeting. Um, Instead of using the high tech, uh, you know, raise your hand uh, thing that exists on Zoom, just raise your hand by your head, and I'll be able to see it on my uh, to call on people. And uh, if you'd keep your mics muted, generally, if you're not speaking, that would be helpful. And um, I'll make sure. Please remind me if I don't invite the public to comment on each of our items because that's important. Um, I'm not sure if we have any members of the public online yet. I don't see any pictures from any of them, but we may have some later in the meeting. Um, Mr. Chair? Let me, um, first of all, um, today's meeting is being broadcast by Community Television of Santa Cruz County. Um, I wanna um, thank them, particularly Jordan Vasconis for his uh, work. Uh, we couldn't be doing this without them. Appreciate their, their support. Um, and let me start by asking um, <clears throat> if there are um, any comments from uh, directors on items that are not on our meeting agenda this morning. I don't see any hands. Then I'm gonna ask if there are members of the general public who would like to make comments to us on items that are about related to transit that are not on our agenda this morning. Can I ask, Gina, do we have any members uh, of the public on listening or tuned yeah, in? Mr. Chair, you have uh, 30 attendees, wow. uh, which is a combination of uh, Metro staff union representation, and uh, the, there is likely some public participants here. There are a number of phone numbers that don't have names associated with them, so those would be difficult to tell. Well, let me ask, uh, we'll take a moment here. Well, it might be some good air time, but let's ask if there are any members of the public who have comments to us on COVID issues on items not on the agenda this morning. Let me check with Gina to see if anybody's raising their hand and nobody has raised their hand. All right, <clears throat> let me ask if there are any members of the labor organizations who'd like to comment to us on items not on this morning's agenda. James Sandoval. Mr. Chair? Yes, James, go ahead. <clears throat> Welcome. Good morning. Good morning. Can you guys hear me? Yes, quite yes. well. Thank you. So I just want to reiterate like my last message regarding what we drivers are facing every day, because it's very difficult to capture what we're actually going through. Um, we are on the front lines risking our lives. We're on the, you know, in the face of this deadly virus, 
have to go home to our families praying we didn't get it, bring it home. We have been dealing with frustrated and belligerent passengers on our buses with all the new rules and policies. Uh, the tension is extremely high out there and we can't even run away when someone is coughing or sneezing inside of our bus. Um, we really hope Metro and you all as board of directors appreciate what our drivers have been asked to do. Not only have we stepped up to the plate, we have not asked for much during this time and we've actually sacrificed financially to help us get through this. Uh, this speaks to our dedication to Metro in this community. The drivers are the unsung heroes, making sure essential workers get to their essential job and the community could still get to their doctor's appointments and be able to put food on their table. We know hard decisions are around the corner and we hope us frontline heroes, we drivers, after all we've done and continue to do, won't be the only one sacrificing to help keep Metro afloat. Thank you. Thanks, James. I'm sure your comments reflect the views of the board as a whole as well. Any other comments from labor organizations? <clears throat> None at this time. Okay. Um, are there any new uh, changes, items on the agenda, uh, new documentation? There are none. Um, do we have any written communications from the Metro Advisory Committee, the MAC as it's known? We have none. Okay. Next on our agenda is the consent agenda. These are uh, items we will consider all in a single action. Um, if staff will help me, what are the what are the numbers uh, on the consent agenda? The item numbers. Item eight zero one through eight one two. So all of the eights, basically. Let right. me ask if there anybody on the board uh, who would like to uh, pull one of these for further discussion and and uh, perhaps not accepting the. Staff recommendation. You You're see? sharing your screen there, and so now I can't see people's faces. Uh, so, G is anybody Gina's, raising their hand? Gina's double checking, nobody electronically raising their hand. I'd like to thank Gina. She's getting just even better and better on being able to show us the consent agenda. Good job. Let me ask if there are any members of the public who would like to uh, comment on any of the consent agenda items? Those are the items under number eight in various letters. Just oh, actually, nothing, nothing yet, Mr. Chair. If you want to just give it a couple seconds, sometimes there's a little bit of lag time. Yes, let's do that. We're not showing anything. I'd like to move this consent agenda. This is first That's McPherson second. motion, second by Larry Pegler. Any other? Uh, comments on the consent agenda? I see none. We have a roll call vote, please, Gina. Mr. Chair, just double checking motion. Was that um, uh, Mr. McPherson? McPherson is the motion and Pegler is the second. Pegler the second. Okay, Gina is going to come over here and do the roll call vote. And I apologize, we're doing the bounce back between the computers because if I turn my sound on, we're going to get some horrible reverb and you don't want that. Well, I'm sure we'll survive that horrible situation if you have to go back and forth. I'll get my steps in. The roll call vote for this motion is Dr. Bottorf. Aye. Dr. Kaufman Gomez. Aye. Dr. Gonzalez. Aye. Dr. Leopold. Aye. Dr. Lind. Aye. Dr. Matthews. Oh, she's not there yet. Dr. McPherson? Aye. Dr. Myers? Aye. Dr. Pegler? Aye. Dr. Rothwell? Aye. Dr. Rotkin? Aye. Unanimous. Unanimous for all those present, that's with Matthews absent. Um, so that carries. Um, we're now on to item number nine. This has to do with presentation of employee longevity awards. And I'm gonna read some information. I want everybody to sort of like buckle your seats for the first one. Our first uh, person is John Fuentes, who has 40 years of service with the Metro Transit District, 40 years of service. 
yeah. think about that for a moment. <laughs> Were there buses when he started? <laughs> it came a little after I did, actually, but I was not here the whole time. I left for at least six years in the middle, and he's been here the whole time. Pretty <laughs> impressive. I'm going to read you a little bit about John. John Fuentes started driving for Metro in 1980. He remembers driving his Grumman bus down 41st Avenue during the 1989 earthquake, watching the telephone poles on either side of the street rock side to side like rubber. That day, he was very concerned for his family and young children who were at home and probably very frightened, yet he knew he had a duty to perform, so he stayed the course and completed his driving assignments that day. He's driven over a million miles with Metro, and his motivation to keep on driving is simple and one we all share here at Metro, to help people. So when let's uh, actually we we could have I, I think applause as best we can do here at this distance and so uh, have virtual applause for those with their mics closed. Thank you. That's very impressive, I have to say. Uh, driver Erlen Osorio, Osorio, 15 years of service, began his career with Metro in May 2005. Since that time, has received the Safe Driver Award and has never had a chargeable incident or accident during his tenure with the Santa Cruz Metro. Recently, Erlen married one of his fellow operators, Ms. Norma Flores. Erlen also serves as the president for Smart Local and is well-versed on all the union work rules. Let's have applause for him as well, I think appropriate. Cynthia, welcome. Let's note that Cynthia Matthews has uh, joined the meeting. Uh, also, in terms of longevity, we have Vicky Sanchez, who has 20 years of service. Vicky Sanchez joined Metro in, 20, uh, in uh, 2000 uh, as a customer service representative working from Pacific Station customer service booth, service booth. She's been serving our customers in the booth and phone, selling tickets and providing travel information. Vicky has demonstrated her creativity in helping to create the coloring book used at the county fair in the early days, much to the delight of our young passengers. As Metro expanded its services and ridership, Vicki helped develop and participated in the uh, public outreach and represented Metro at many uh, on and off site public presentations. When Metro brought its paratransit service in house, <clears throat> um, she assisted Metro and her SEA union in fi finalizing an acceptable working agreement that eventually brought our service to efficient ride delivery for all. Vicki has repeatedly shown her dedication um, to our Spanish speaking community working for Metro's customer service booth at Watsonville Station, as well as on the phones assisting our Spanish speaking passengers who rely and depend upon both our fixed route and paratransit services. Vicki's focus and dedication to the Santa Cruz County public has been her number one priority. And Metro thanks her for representing us so well through these ever-changing years. Vicki's an established member of the customer service team, and we're pleased to honor her today with an award for her service. Congratulations, Vicki, <coughs> and applause for her as well, I think, is appropriate. And last but not least, Mario Torres has 15 years of service. He's also receiving his 15 years of service award. He has received his 10 years uh, Safe Driver Award in 2017 and a safe driver award for both uh, 2018 and 2019. When Mario isn't driving for Metro, he DJs, rides his mountain bike or motorcycles, and spends time with his son and two grandchildren. So let's have applause for his service as well. Are there any director comments on this item? Any comments from members of the public on this item? Not showing any hands raised at this time. Thank you. Next, we have uh, item number 10. This, we have a resolutions of appreciation for retirees. Um, and in the, the fact that they can't be here today, I'd like to thank both John Ghost, as it pronounced, and Bonnie Moore for their many years of service to the Metro. Um, let me ask if there are any director comments at this point. Uh, Chair, I would move the resolutions that are attached. That's a motion by Leopold. I second have... by Pugler, who's got his mic off, second. but his hand in the air. I'm take second, that as a please. Second. <laughs> and uh, any other comments from any uh, directors? Any comments from the general public? Not really showing any. 
Um, let me just double check, Mr. Chair, before we do it. Uh, yes, not showing anything. Okay, then let me ask Gina to please call a roll on these resolutions. Okay. Director Botswark. Aye. Director Kaufman Gomez. Aye. Director Gonzalez. Aye. Director Leopold. Aye. Director Lynn. Aye. Director Matthews. Aye. Welcome. Director McPherson. Aye. Director Myers. Aye. Director Pegler. Aye. Director Rothwell. Aye. Director Rotkin. Aye. Unanimous. Thank you very much. That is a unanimous vote. Um, and we want to appreciate uh, those folks who just retired recently from the district for their years of service. Um, next is item number 11. This is consideration of a resolution approving a compensation adjustment for the CEO and a fourth amendment to his employment agreement. Um, let me say that there's, we had a uh, committee, a, a temporary uh, a committee that was appointed to uh, do an initial review. We, we met in closed session um, at our last meeting uh, and the whole board discussed this issue. Um, so I think people have a clear idea of what the information that was gathered by the committee. Uh, I interviewed all the, the uh, uh, man, top managers and about two thirds of the people in the next rank of managers, as well as talking to the um, each of the unions, in fact, the subgroups of the unions to sort of get any input that I could before we met and the board got that information. Um, we are, um, as a board, um, the, uh, the recommendation from uh, the committee, I guess that's the best way to present this to the board, is that we um, give Alex Clifford a two-step increase. Last year, uh, we did not have a review because we were under uh, undergoing negotiations and a number of other difficult issues. Uh, so basically, Alex Clifford uh, on his own initiated this, but we agreed that we not have a review at that point. So we would like to uh, basically increase his uh, steps by two, one for last year and one for this. These steps would be, these are the, these, this is not a pay increase uh, in like a COLA um, or some special award. This is a step increase. The district has not denied any of our members any of their step increases, despite all the crisis that we're going through. And so, as long as Alex is performing satisfactorily, he would get these step increases. The board's decision is that his performance has been well above satisfactory. Uh, any, we do have issues which we've talked with him about, and we'll continue to talk with him about. But in terms of his overall performance, I think people believe uh, from the board that it's been excellent. So I'm looking at this point for, uh, before we do the, the uh, final vote on this, but I want to get the motion on the floor. Uh, I'm looking for a motion that we, I see Donna Lynn's hand in the air, that we increase his, I'll let you I turn your mic on and make the motion. Go ahead. Yes, I would, I would move approval of this uh, recommendation for a step increase for the two years. And noting too, uh, he didn't ask for a retroactive. Um, right, there's no retroactive pay in this, that's correct. Yeah, right. I'll second I want to add before I again open this to the public, I think the board believes that Alex has done an, an excellent job uh, during the last period in general and that an extraordinary job since we've been hit by this COVID crisis. Um, and I think that's a unanimous view of the board at this point. It's been under very difficult kinds of conditions and we think that uh, things are going as well as they could at the district given the constraints that we're operating under, which are quite severe. Um, I think there's been uh, improved communication between Alex and the, uh, the um, labor organizations uh, during this period, trying to, because we're, it's difficult times. And I think everybody recognizes that. And so I think we've had good cooperation, both from management and our labor groups. And I think the board's quite pleased with Alex's performance at this point. And uh, the motion's now on the floor. Let me now ask if there are any members of the public, including the labor organizations, who'd like to comment on what uh, this motion that's now on the floor in front of us. James Sandoval has his hand up, Mr. Chair. James, please go ahead. Hello again. Um, I just wanted to mention Alex has been doing a tremendous job, and it's sometimes a roller coaster ride when dealing with issues. However, we always come out with a positive solution when we move forward. Um, I do want to take a note that the drivers have taken cuts. We lost our bids, and people are being laid off all around us. 
Uh, we believe Alex's step increase should be frozen or postponed until we get a better idea of where Metro is financially. Okay, thank you for your comment. Any other comments from the public or labor organizations? Any additional comments Wait, from board? Mr. 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 Chair, I'm sorry. We, we just got to give it a couple seconds. Sometimes there's a little lag. Bill yeah. Henson. Bill Henson. Bill, go ahead. Your mic is muted, Bill. You're going to have to turn off your, your uh, mute thing. Turn on your mic. Uh, let's see. Each, I, sh I cannot do that from here. Right? I can't. Yeah, we can't do it. Bill, if you're hearing me, you need to turn your mic on. Yeah, we don't have the ability to unmute. Bill, if you're on a computer, if you could push your space bar, that might resolve the issue. I don't know how they would do it if they're on a phone. It should just Ian, be able to... Ian, can you unmute at your end? Because I don't have that control. Still muted. While Bill is trying to get on, um, let me ask Julie if there's any additional words as our attorney that she needs to say about this uh, matter that's before us. Thanks, Chair. Um, you, you know, under the Brown Act, you're required to do an oral summary of the motion and the action being taken. You basically have already done it. I'm just going to do it a little bit more just to capture it for the record. Um, the committee's recommendation is to approve an increase of the CEO's compensation to $21,029 a month. That is step four of his employment agreement. And that reflects a June 15th, 2017 COLA increase of 2%. And that will go along with the corresponding Fourth Amendment to his employment agreement. Thank you. I see Bill is now unmuted. Bill, go ahead. You have a comment. Yeah, um, I mean, I, I want to uh, indicate to all you guys, like drivers and everything, that you guys are, you know, out there contri contributing. I mean, I'm sorry I came in the middle of this whole, whole like, deal. Um, I'm a frequent writer for the Santa Cruz Metro, and uh, I just want to, over time, see if we could, uh, you know, see if we can imp improve improve the Metro as a whole. And I, and I have some pr pretty unorthodox ideas. Bill, let me uh, suggest that you send us an email at this point. That's the best way we can probably communicate for any thoughts that you have. We'd be happy to like look them over and respond to your concerns. Um, well, if you go to the I mean, part, part of it is, and I'm not knocking anyone whatsoever from top to bottom. I, I feel with this with this whole crisis coming down real quick we all of us need to be, need to come together no matter who no matter who it is from executives to management to assistant management etc cetera, etc cetera. and i i would like to see them plus a lot of other people you know let's let's come to a deal where we don't just talk about it we we act on it like i could i could write an email to pe to people but who kn who knows where that'll get funneled to and who knows if that'll get intercepted how long that's going to you know take in getting a reply back one of my projects i just did right uh, a few days ago is help change a website into being fully compliant with all of the the ADA, the WC, the WCGA 2.0, 2.1 guidelines. And it only took roughly 48 hours. So Bill, let me just assure you, if you send us an email, if you go to our website, you'll find a way that's, that allows you to make comments 
I will assure you that that will get to every board member and uh, <clears throat> as well as our CEO and and uh, anybody who uh, has a response to be able to give one. And I will assure you that I will read it carefully and certainly give you some response once I see it. Um, so if you do want to add additional things in detail, please feel free to send us an email. We do respond uh, when people con uh, contact us and we want to make sure that the public knows that their ideas are being taken seriously. Thank you. Thanks for your comments this morning. Sure. sure. Anybody else from the public? No further hands, Mr. Chair, at this time. Okay. Uh, we have a roll call vote then. Oh, sorry, Donna Lind has a comment. Just one thing I wanted to add, uh, something that our city, uh, our uh, Metro attorney advised us too, is this is under contract that, um, you know, it isn't a, really an optional. It's something that uh, Alex is under contract to receive as long as he's performing um, at least standard. So it's not uh, not additional compensation or raises or these, you know, anything of that nature. So. Thanks for that clarification. It's not, that's not to say we might not give him an additional increase. He'll be, be in a position to do it. But but this one, all he had to be was satisfactory. And the board's view is that he's quite above that level. Thank you. All right. Can we have a roll call vote, please, Gina, on this uh, action? Um, just before I go on, Mr. Chair, I'd like to Mr. Henson, we do have the email address if you want to send your thoughts to board inquiries at fcmtd.com, and that's a great place to start. Okay, roll call. Director Botsworth. Aye. Director Coppin Gomez. Aye. Director Gonzalez. Aye. Director Leopold. Aye. Director Lind. Aye. Director Matthews. Aye. Dr. McPherson? Aye. Dr. Myers? Aye. Dr. Pegler? Aye. Dr. Rothwell? Aye. Director Rockton? Aye. Unanimous. That's unanimous. Again, Alex, thank you for your service. And uh, we'll now move on to our next item. That's item number 12, which is the CEO's report. Nice place to, nice segue there. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and in advance of that, uh, thank you to you and the board for that vote of confidence. It's been a pleasure serving you for six years. It's been a great relationship. We have been through some really interesting times during that period of time, and uh, we've navigated our way through that, and I appreciate that. It's a, It's been a fabulous board to work with, so thank you so much. Um, okay, going on to the... We have... Uh, number of items that I wanted to cover. So if you'll hang in there with me. First of all, we always like to talk about uh, new hires and promotions. And we have Mariano Burnell, who um, has been a temp employee for us and was running up against his uh, hours uh, limitation. And during this COVID crisis, uh, we felt that we needed uh, some additional IT support and he's been uh, happy to stay on board as a provisional. We, we don't have a position to, to hire him, uh, nor can we commit to such a thing right now, but um, he will stay on board and continue to help us at least through this COVID crisis as a provisional employee. Um, and then we have uh, Matthew Marquez, who uh, is moving from one provisional position to another pro provisional position to continue to help us out in the planning department. So we're happy that he's agreed to stay and help us out. He does a lot of fine work for us, including various types of surveys out on the, on the lines. And uh, maybe more recently, you might recall our bus replacement program, which was quite an intense program that uh, was undertaken over numerous, uh, several months. And he pulled together quite a wonderful spreadsheet for us to help us understand where we are at and what the challenges are ahead and how we can get into a state of good repair. Uh, then Ryan McDonald from the parts and materials lead to parts and materials supervisor. Uh, so congratulations to all of those folks. Um, we have really dedicated staff and it's always nice to see um, internal promotions too. Uh, I wanted to point out briefly that uh, if you noticed at our transit centers, we're flying the flag at half mast today. And that is in honor of police officers Memorial Day. So that is happening today and we'll, we'll leave those flags a half mass through the weekend. And 
Now, now I'd like to go into, I have several items, but the next item is three consecutive videos that I'd like to play. They're very brief. So is it Ian that's going to play those for us? Ian? If... And Ian, if you can hear me, we're not hearing any sound at this end. That was a very nice piece put together by the California Transit Association. We are a member of that. I sit on their executive committee. Um, well done acknowledging uh, our, our uh, employees working on the front lines, our heroes. Okay, Ian, if you want to go to the next one, um, there you go. Oh, you want to replay that with the sound? <laughs> Play the game with the sound. We have enough time. I did the music we must. Well done by the CTA. And on to video number two, please. During these challenging times, I want to give a very special shout out to all the public transit workers who are going above and beyond the call of duty to keep these critical systems operational. Your courage, determination, and dedication inspire all of us. You are a critical link to helping others in our communities get to work and access essential services. You are helping our country get through this crisis and successfully prepare for an economic recovery. The department is on the job 24 seven, doing everything possible to help you, including getting federal dollars out quickly. Thank you for all that you do for all of us. Thank you, Ian. And then on to the third video. Metro is taking extra steps to ensure passengers and drivers are safe when they ride on any of their buses. Every day, 30 to 35 buses are sanitized inside vehicle service worker wears protective gear during the disinfecting process is called fogging. You make sure that he gets all the corners, nooks and crannies behind the seats, under the seats, uh, ceilings, everything, so that the entire bus is completely covered by the time he exits the bus. Drivers are also protected by plastic sheeting that kind of looks like a shower curtain, to be honest. Metro also hired 10 additional employees to help with the disinfecting process. Great, hey, little news story, local news story. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Ian, if we could move on to the photos. So each meeting, uh, I try to give you a couple of photos representing some of the things that have been going on since we last met. Ian, if you'd put the series of photos on. signs that we had developed uh, for the sides of our bus since we had some vacant space on the bus. Buses, we, we added several COVID messages. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. This is on the interior of the buses. This is one of the first signs that went up uh, way back in early March. Next slide, please. Added later uh, when face covering became required by the county. Next slide. And of course, we've been broadcasting the six feet of se social separation for quite some time. Next slide, please. 
Uh, some of our uh, materials that we have on the buses, um, this is slide is here because of the, uh, the slot on the far right, Attention Metro Riders. That is a, a, a trifold brochure that we have been updating regularly as, as things have changed in our service and our requirements. So we use that on the bus for customers to understand what we're doing and why we're doing it. And then also our security personnel at the terminals hand those out to customers to help them understand, particularly the biggest issue being the capacity restrictions on the buses. Next slide, please. Uh, IT did a fabulous job when, when I asked them to uh, put, uh, have the head signs intermittently reflect essential travel only. Within a week, they were able to get all of the buses programmed. And then our folks over in the maintenance were able to get it uploaded in a very timely fashion. So this flashes intermittently on our head signs just to reinforce that message. Next slide, please. Uh, the the um, news brief talked about the shower curtain, if you will. Actually, that's a pretty accurate depiction of it or representation of it. It is, in fact, that type of a product. It is a clear product. Um, and what the bus operator is able to do, next slide, is to close that. You can see it in its open position. So when they're driving, they have it in an open position. There's magnets that have been installed. Um, Eddie and his teams have done a fabulous job over in maintenance getting these placed on the buses. It's not complete yet. Uh, we're, we're hoping to have that complete within a week or so. Um, but when it's when they're driving, they put it in the open position. The magnets keep it out of their way. Next slide, please. And then when they pull up to a stop and customers are boarding, as you might recall, not every bus has the ability for a driver to actuate the rear door. We have old fashioned buses in which you have to push on the rear door to open it. Um, only about 25% of our fleet, our newer buses actually have that actuator. So many, many people still board through the front door, potentially exposing our operators. And so when they pull up to the stop, they close the curtain like this and that gives them some additional isolation against the airborne droplets. Next slide, please. And then you saw on the news clip, uh, the additional cleaners that we hired. Next slide, please. These are folks that are placed, two of them at Pacific Station, one at Watsonville, one at Capitola, and one at Scotts Valley Transit Center. And each time a bus pulls through there, they dip their rag into the disinfectant, they jump on that bus, and they very quickly move through a, a disinfecting of that bus. So the buses get disinfected at night, and then, of course, they go out on the, on the road, and uh, you know, germs and viruses can accrue thereafter. Uh, so this adds another layer of protection that each time that bus comes through a terminal, it gets a quick wipe down of disinfecting so that if, if it picked up something between last night and today, um, we're able to jump on it with our cleaners. And these are all temporary employees. They have a great attitude. They're doing a fabulous job. Next slide, please. Capitola uh, cleaner. And I think, is, uh, next slide, please. And uh, such a such a nice slide to close with. Um, this is this is what you have to don in order to get on a bus and fog it, and that's what we do in addition to what occurs at night. Um, because we're running uh, roughly sixty percent of our service, we have a lot of buses in the yard daytime, so we do additional fogging during the daytime of those buses, so that when they get put in service in the next day or so. They are uh, they are disinfected and ready to go, and I think that's the last slide. Up, oh, thank you to all of our Metro Frontline heroes. Okay, so finally, I'd like to just go on with a couple of legislative updates. Uh, as you all no doubt saw, the governor released the May revise of the budget for the 2021. Um, we're still digesting that, but clearly. The one number that sticks out is a projection in the coming year of a negative 27.2% uh, decline in sales tax revenues. That is huge. Um, not surprised by it, but that, that is huge. Now, how we interpret that, we'll see in the days to come. I mean, certainly a straight line approach is every month for the next year is down 272 
Uh, it could be any combination of numbers you could have for the first few months, 50, 60% declines, and then decreasing to five or 10% by the end of the year with an overall average of 27.2 by the end of the year. There's different ways that will manifest itself. And we won't really know that until we start seeing actual data come in. And, and I know this is no new message for those of you at cities and, and at the county. You're hearing the same exact thing. We're, we're um, trying to determine based on very limited information, how to make projections into the next year. And I think we're all of the same frame of mind that you can't look back in history and grab some piece of history and apply it to the situation. We've all looked at the uh, great recession following the 2008 uh, crash. Um, there are things we can learn there, but we don't think you can apply that model to what's going on right now. Um, and, then, and then if you're following unemployment, it continues to escalate, which is concerning. Um, so big, big predictions, at least for now, we would certainly expect the state to continue to modify that. They've even sent, uh, um, the, they've even communicated the message that we can expect that there'll be additional revise as those, those, uh, those numbers start coming in. On the federal level, uh, APTA, our um, American Public Transportation uh, organization that we belong to, uh, put together a proposal that they, they sent to Congress last week for a second round of CARES, would, uh, we'll just characterize it as CARES Act 2 for now. Um, I will tell you that I actually op oppose that particular proposal because it is a po proposal that panders very heavily to New York and their demands for $4 billion uh, and also other very large transit agencies. And it places smaller to mid-sized transit agencies in a position in which basically we, we compete in a much smaller pot, a 20% pot under their proposal for a significantly smaller amount of money. Um, I just firmly believe that's the wrong way to go. I think Congress and the FTA got it right in round one. Here's act one in which they took a, a, a bulk sum of money uh, that they approved um, about $24 billion and they put it through the FTA 5307 and 5311 program uh, and dealt it out to us in a formula fashion. Um, I think that's the right approach. It's still based on reimbursement, but through that approach, we know today upon enactment and signature by the president, we know today how much money we have to work with as we're planning forward. So, you know, the APTA proposal, um, is, is heavily flawed in, in my opinion. And uh, it also changes that dynamic away from the 5307, 5311 formula program to a based on need program out in time. Um, here's the challenge. Um, it's, it's, and it's also structured proportionally. So under a proportional look, if New York is, puts in their need, their demand, um, and they get 30% and we put in ours, we might get 30% of what we ask for. Um, but that happens after you've made the expenditures. In, in this case, it's difficult for us to, to gamble on that. We can't maintain a certain level of expenditures on a hope and a prayer that we'll get reimbursed some amount of money that's likely not gonna be anywhere near 100%. So if we go down that road and we get 50% of what we ask for, where does the other 50% come from? We're in a deficit situation. So it's a horrible proposal. Um, and, then, and then transition to the HEROES proposal, which is uh, presumably being adopted by Congress today. Um, on our part of that, I realize there's money in there for cities and counties, and I applaud that, and for roads. But on our transit part of that proposal, uh, it has the same types of flaws as the APTA proposal, but goes even further in the negative direction by now isolating out 14 uh, transit agency regions that have populations of 3 million or greater, uh, and they would get uh, $11.7 billion of the total 15.7 billion proposed. So we're not even in, as a small transit agency, we're, we're not in that mix at all. We would be in a, a uh, a sub pot of about $4 billion that we could compete for. And similar to what I described as the dilemma with the APTA challenge, 
we would be presented with the same dilemma in which we would have to gamble and hope that we could get some portion of that and make 100% expenditures hoping to get something less than 100% back again, running a deficit situation. CARES Act got it right. Run it through the formula. Let us know today what we can do to help cover our expenses going forward. And we can keep the service at, the, at, at reasonable levels. We can keep our employment at reasonable levels because we have a known quantity. It's difficult to gamble on an unknown. Now, hopefully this will all change. The word is that um, the, the HEROES Act is, is, the term is using publicly, is, is dead on arrival at the Senate. Um, the Senate has given some indication um, that they will not want to talk about this till sometime in June. They will, they will likely have to talk about it uh, at some point in the near future. And the, the, the important thing about the HEROES Act is it becomes sort of a document that they could potentially work from as they remold what their proposal would be. And then ultimately the House and the Senate have to reconcile their two proposals. So there's a lot of process ahead and a lot of opportunity to try to get messages through that help them understand better what actions they may take, how they impact particularly small to mid-sized transit agencies. So I'll try to keep you informed on that as we go forward. And let me just double check with Mr. Chair. I think that concludes my CEO comments. It does. Let me ask if there are questions. I'll start with one. Have, have we got our 20 million yet? So um, that's somewhat tongue in cheek, but no, it, it's a good it's question. A question. There, there are a number of um, constituencies out there who believe that the federal government sent us a 20 million dollar check and that it's not how it works. 5307, 5311 formula program is a reimbursement program. And, and under that guideline or under that, under, under that program, um, the CARES Act program, we can go back to January 20 of this year. So we've put in place all of our paperwork that's required at the front end to be approved for those drawdowns. Wandamu has done a fantastic job in keeping up on that, both on the 5307 and the 5311 side. And we've already put in for our first partial reimbursement under the 5311. And we've done, uh, we're finishing up on the process for the 5307, which is the bigger chunk of money. And what will happen is we'll end up drawing it down in likely in, for example, monthly tranches. So we should, based on our expenditure rate, we think sometime around July or August, we'll have those dollars drawn down. Now there's another much more complicated part of this equation that we'll start talking to the finance committee about at their next committee in June, and then ultimately the full board, into your full board meeting on, on how the mechanics of this work against the other revenues that flow into this agency. Um, so we'll be talking in finance soon about that, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Are there other board members with comments on, yes, John Leopold. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thanks for the presentation, Alex. Um, uh, first of all, it's, uh, I just really appreciate seeing uh, the pictures of uh, what's going on every day. I think that's important also for the public to see. I'm glad KSBW uh, did the story and the Pyronian did the story uh, about the extra efforts that the Metro is, is uh, using to uh, help ensure safety on our buses. And, and it's good to see the ingenuity about figuring out ways to help protect our drivers too. Um, with regards to the funding, um, it, it, in some ways it's not surprising and in some ways it is surprising. It's not surprising about uh, forgetting about smaller systems. We know that uh, when the first CARES Acts passed, a local government assistant was, was for only those with 500,000 or more and uh, the number of jurisdictions that actually qualify for that was less than 100 nationwide. And so uh, we're hoping in, an, in another round, whatever the bill is called, that there is local government support for everybody else in the country. Um, and we're all fighting for that. What I'm surprised about is uh, APTA and the role that they're playing because they're supposed to, you know, we, we, we've been uh, faithful members of uh, APTA for, uh, for decades, uh, I'm surprised that they have um, uh, put forward a proposal which leaves out small systems like ours. 
Uh, can you give me any insight about what's going on there? And, you know, it, it really question, it makes me question that during our time of need, if we can't count on that organization, why are we part of it? Yeah, I think that's a great question, great observations. Uh, there is a little bit of history to this. Uh, a year or two ago, New York dropped out of APTA uh, because they felt APTA wasn't representing them well. In other words, they weren't able to flex their big muscle as strongly as they thought they should be able to do. So they dropped out. Uh, and APTA, uh, unfortunately, fell all over themselves to do whatever they could do to try to pander to New York to get them back into the APTA program, which they did. They got them back in. And so now New York, in particular, are, their representatives are taking advantage of that. And basically, they've leveraged uh, APTA by saying, hey, you know, if, if you don't get this right for us, we need $4 billion in round one, and we need $4 billion in round two. And if you don't get it right, we're going to go it alone, and we're big, and we're strong, and we can, we can make things complicated. And you can imagine how difficult that would be to have a major city, a major state, a major transit property like that going it alone for such a significant chunk of money when APTA has a different agenda over here. So APTA um, combined theirs, uh, well, um, gave in to what, what New York wanted to do. And, uh, bas and basically what New York has been able to do is to solicit some other large transit agencies to join them so they're not going it alone and, and, and leveraging that at APTA. I'm very disappointed. I'm still trying to fight that at APTA to make sure that my colleagues understand what I explained to you about the difference between knowing what you have today and spending against it versus a hope and a prayer in the future that you might get some partial reimbursement, but yet you may still go into bankruptcy. Um, it is disappointing. It is very disappointing. And Mr. Chair, as you know, uh, uh, um, and, and Mr. Leopold, as you know, we, we do the annual journey to Washington, D.C. We didn't this year for COVID reasons, but we always go visit APTA. So please keep this in the forefront of your mind for the next time we go visit APTA and talk to their CEO. Yeah, I mean, it seems to me that it's also worthwhile to, to try to activate the coalition that helped pass the small transit systems uh, uh, um, uh, funding portion uh, years back. You know, there's a, there, there are a lot of us uh, that are small transit systems. Um, there are obviously the big players in the, in the big cities, but uh, it seems to me that we need to be putting together a coalition because there's a lot of members of Congress that represent those smaller systems um, than there is the, that represents the bigger systems. And I just think we have to fight to be able to get resources. Let, let me I, add that this, this is not really anything completely new. Uh, for years now, we've had an issue with APTA about their sort of, not just this recent thing with New York, but generally their focus on the larger properties and larger cities. And that's why we now have both formal and informal relationships with other small districts already uh, that we've been involved in. And, and, and what's the, Alex, I forget the name of the association we belong to that actually is a, a different group than APTA and often at odds with APTA on their recommendations to Congress. Yeah, you could describe that as sort of a splinter group. That is the bus coalition. And Thank you. We, we have a call on Monday and this will be a big part of that topic. Um, I'm also running this discussion through CALAC, which is, an, which is the state organization representing the smaller agencies um, to see if I can get their buy-in too to sort of rejecting the APTA side of this. Any other comments from uh, board members about this item or other things, Cynthia? Yeah, I, I actually raised my hand electronically, but I don't know what works best. But you weren't here when I said earlier that we're going to, I'm not going to use that. Just raise your hand. Oh, while you're okay. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, well, starting at the top, uh, thank you for the photos of all the COVID messaging on the buses. Um, I'm assuming that you've shared those with the county health officer, but if not, uh, I encourage you to do so. I think it's, it's helpful for everyone to know how uh, quote, we are all in this together, and that's a great way to use those messages, um, as well as the cleaning, but the messages are great. So um, I encourage you to share those and and with our our city jurisdictions as well. It's good to know what everyone's working on. Um, and on the APTA, again, probably stating the obvious, uh, I assume you've been communicating with our, our local uh, house members on that. and. Um, we have good relationships, and I second John's comments about 
I'm not being passive on this one. It's obviously still in flux. We are uh, just on that point. We can do. Let us know what we can do. And also, do you see a role for League of California Cities on this, or you know, other other jurisdictions? Absolutely. And and just on that point, uh, Chris Gilio, our federal representative um, uh, lobbyist, um, and I have been communicating, and he's getting those messages out. The the sense that we both had right now is what is happening today is a juggernaut. You can't get in the way of it. We're just a small portion of a much, much bigger Christmas tree that has a whole bunch of ornaments hanging off of it. Um, there's there's much more to happen in the coming days that we can try to influence. Just to get a sense of the scale of this, Alex had said there's maybe 100 agencies would be funded out of the proposal that's at least moving forward at this point. There are 50,000 cities in America. Yeah, yeah. The idea that 100 people get money and the other remainder of the 50,000 get almost nothing or a trivial amount is really not acceptable. Any other comments from board members? Are there any members of the public, and I'll pause here uh, to ask to check it out, whether who want to comment on Alex's CEO report? So far, no hands, Mr. Chair. Okay. Um, next, uh, Alex has a report specifically on COVID-19 uh, and then our response to that, some of that was covered in his uh, CEO's report, but he may have additional things he'd like to add. Sure, Mr. Chair, this is, uh, this is a graphic that I put together, COVID fiscal crisis graphic, um, to try to somehow boil down a really super complex uh, uh, analysis and challenge yet ahead into something visually that tries to represent what we're, what we're faced with right now and what we think is coming down the road. This was presented to the Finance Committee and discussed. But what I wanted to do is to make sure that you understand sort of visually some of the challenges yet ahead as we plan. I mean, you could say, gee, it's a no-brainer. Tax is gonna drop dramatically um, and, and CARES Act money is only gonna go so far and we should start decreasing our operating costs now. Um, take dramatic uh, F efforts to reduce service and overall operating costs, including overhead. Um, what I'm trying to show here is that no, let's, let's not take a reflex action like that. Let's breathe a little. Um, the CARES Act money thankfully allows us the opportunity to breathe a little. Um, it's, not a, it's not a fix to the, to the economic problem. Um, I won't use any more words than to say it's a bridge. All it is, is a bridge. And we don't know how big that bridge is yet. Um, but as, as we look at our operation, um, we have to prepare for the summer bid, which we have, we have done and we're in the final stages of completing. Uh, and then soon thereafter, we start preparing for the fall bid. And if we're gonna do dramatic things, um, aside from sort of an emergency bid, like James has helped us out on twice now, um, you know, we need to plan a little bit in advance. Uh, it, and as I discussed earlier, it's difficult to do anything, just like at the cities and the county, it's difficult to do anything uh, dramatic because we don't know what's gonna happen to our sales tax dollars. We are an agency much like a lot of other agencies that are heavily dependent on revenues that are dependent on the economy, economy dependent revenues. Well, later this month, maybe as soon as next week, we might get a little glimmer when we get the, the sales tax dollars, uh, uh, sales tax calculations in for March. And remember March will show sort of a partial impact of COVID uh, because things really began to be shut down around mid-March. Uh, and then another 30 days later and 30 days thereafter, we'll get you know, successive months of data. April data, which we won't get until almost the end of June, starts to really give us some insight into what one month of COVID uh, economic impact looks like. So we wanna, we wanna get that information, track it, analyze it, trend it, study it, uh, and, then, and then match that against the drawdown of the CARES Act money. So what you see is for now, <laughs> it looks like we're pretty secure in, in making our way through to the fall bid. 
Um, now that becomes an interesting challenge at that point because, um, you know, again, we have to sort of prepare for that in advance. And one of our uh, significant funding sources are the two educational institutions, UCSC and Cabrillo. Um, and, and all likelihood, we think at this point, although we don't have final analysis or, or announcements, all likelihood, at least we think in the fall, uh, they will stay with online and not go back to in-person classes. So that's interesting because remember, they tend to be about 60% of our ridership. So, and, and then now factor in the 27.2% projected decrease in sales tax revenues, uh, CARES Act money probably won't carry us through the end of the current fiscal year. Or, or, or through the current, through, through the end of the calendar year, not the fiscal year. The calendar year. Calendar year. I mean, in in this year alone, again, if the state projection is right, we could we could potentially draw down nearly eight point five million dollars of that twenty million just getting through June thirty of twenty twenty. So that money begins to get used up very quickly. Now, what do we do? We, we don't want to be at a fiscal cliff. You don't, we don't want to be in a position like we were at back in 2014-15 where you have to make very dramatic decisions quickly. Um, so we have to be constantly looking forward so that we can plan for whatever is going to occur. If we're going to run out of money before the end of the calendar year, if UCSC and Cabrillo aren't coming back until winter maybe, um, that's a sub substantial amount of our service. If we you know, as we project out running out of money, start bringing our expenses in alignment with projected revenues. Now we're going to cut down on the, the number of, of uh, expenses, the number of employees that we have providing that service. Mm -hmm. And then what happens in the winter if they come back in session? You just can't ramp up and go back to the bank and say, let's Let's pull in another 20 bus operators so we can provide the UCSC service. That, that just doesn't work that way. As a matter of fact, there's no guarantee that if we have to reduce the number of employees we have, that they'll be available to us in the winter. And then if you have to ramp up the machine to go recruit, hire, and train, uh, that takes time. It doesn't, you don't just flip a switch and make that happen. So there's some real challenges. We're, we're, um, we're engaged. I think John is meeting with Dan next week to have conversations with UCSC about you know, how we can work together as a, in a partnership to try to ensure that we have the employees there to provide the service when they need the service to return. Um, that period of uncertainty can move to the left, it can move to the right. This whole graphic is only a point in time. It is as of about April 30th, and it could easily change one way or the other tomorrow based on new data coming in. So don't take the slide to the bank. It's just a representation to show you the very difficult challenges and decisions yet ahead and what the dependencies are. Let, let me note, um, as a faculty member at UCSC, we all received a um, request for proposals for online courses in the fall, $4,000 on top of your regular salary to design a new, uh, online course and you know would meet certain criteria like either a large class or allow people to graduate on time and so forth the UCSC wouldn't be putting out four thousand bucks a pop if they didn't think they were going to be pretty much online in the fall already even though they haven't made that as a formal decision yet it's pretty likely that's where it's going I think we, we assume we assume that to be the case mr. chair uh, any other comments from board or questions from board members about uh, this item the Could the Cabrillo report. College trustee uh, weigh in about uh, what the, what Cabrillo is thinking? Um, uh, our CFO, Angela Aiken, is working with them. Angela, when is your next meeting with them? Is the ball in their court, Cabrillo? Yeah, so Angela has communicated information to them. The ball's in their court. We're waiting for them to come back to us. Alta, you have to unmute yourself if you're going to make a comment. Oh, I wasn't making a comment. I was just nodding. <laughs> <laughs> But, but I, will, I will make a comment. Um, I know that our team is working with Angela to make sure that, um, you know, we can both honor our contract and continue to provide the service that is being provided at a cost that works for us and the 
and the Metro. Um, the decision to go online won't be made until after July 1. So the team is still working together to see what it looks like because there's a possibility we might have some hybrid courses. Um, so anyway, they're working this out and they won't have a answer for us until after July 1. Thanks, Alden. Anyone else? Are there any members of the public that would like to comment on this COVID-19 report? I'll wait a moment for people to check. So far, no hand. Oh, you got a hand, Bill Henson. Bill, go ahead. You have to unmute yourself, Bill. When you first came on, Bill, you had yourself unmuted. So where you it is. Go ahead, Bill. You're on. Um, you know, I want to uh, I want to get that email address again. I heard it in the recording earlier um, by one of your representatives as a point of where I can start um, with the sure. email correspondence. And yes, um, and plus, you know, I want to give a great support to. Um, everyone that's trying to work with Cabrillo and do the hybrid online courses, the, you know, because I know this is a strenuous time for them as well, because the Metro depends on, you know, the students, the faculty as like writers, and please let me know if I'm going off topic. Um, I want to just try to stay on point. And, um, you know, I feel like, you know, we could, I've been listening to everything you guys have all said and it, you know, makes, makes good sense of you got to kind of not only, you know, structure, structure everything, um, accordingly to, do we have money coming in versus more money going out? And, you know, as a, as a right now, everything's, unsure and um you know i just commend like the cabrillo like people to you know give students some type of education during this time and i commend everybody else for you know the drivers being on the front line and you know if if at any point after my initial correspondence i would love to help the metro just in some way innovate the, you know, innovate their, so innovate their services via, maybe we ha might have to be a little unorthodox at times within reason. Um, and just how we get more creative and, you know, look, look forward and look ahead. Thanks, Bill. Um, Gina, can you now, um, Say again what that email is for any member of the public who'd like to comment sure. with us. It's, it's difficult to communicate under these conditions, and so we want to make sure the public is aware that they can speak to us, at least through emails, and or get a response if they uh, have concerns. Yeah, Mr. Chair, I'll go ahead and do that. Uh, just for the general public's knowledge, on page one of the agenda, um, you, you'll find that email address. It's in uh, the blue underline. It's board inquiries at scmtd.com on page one of the agenda if anybody uh, needs to go back and get that. And then also on the website. And you, you can find that uh, agenda on the website and it's also on the website generally as well. Yep. And you'll also find it on page five of the agenda. So okay, it's, it's scattered throughout the agenda. Thank you. And we'll, I'll make sure that, the, I mean, the staff would do this as well, but I'll make sure that we anybody that emails us definitely gets a response back to their concerns. Aurelio. Can we, can we put it on chat for anybody that's online right now? Uh, just for, yeah, Gina's, Gina's going to add it. Basis. She's going to add it to the chat. Uh, Mr. Chair, can I just double back to one other item? Sure, go ahead. Yeah, I, I just, I'm, I'm really trying to encourage a very transparent um, environment right now during these very difficult times. No surprises. It's very difficult for me to talk about reducing service, reducing expenses, you know, potentially laying off, furloughing people down the road. That is very difficult, but I want us to be transparent. I want us to talk about those things 
so that we have them in the forefront of our mind as we move forward. So my message really right now for our representatives at UCSC and Cabrillo is this. We may be looking in the next three, six months, maybe longer, at a sort of non-traditional type of a, a contract. Um, that is a type of a contract in which um, those institutions continue to provide resources to Metro um, in order for us to provide some limited level of service, actually less service than you're paying for, but protecting your ability to have that service in the future. So I, I just wanna put that out there and ask you to start thinking about that as we enter into the negotiations. Um, I, I highlighted the big problem. The big problem is this, if we scale down, it is not as easy as we would hope it would be to scale back up. We need to do everything possible to retain the employees that we have to provide that greater level of service when your two institutions are ready to return. Thanks, Alex. Alta has a comment. And I appreciate that. Thank you for the transparency. And I know that that's also a part of our desired outcome and our communications. Our hope is that we continue service and it may look like we're paying for what's being used. So it may be that the students who actually get a bus pass, that's what we pay. There is a, a lot of room to be creative. And I believe those kinds of conversations are happening. I'm providing input on my side to say, here is what the needs are. And this is what our students are saying. And I know that they, the conversation is active and um, it is, and it's open. Thanks for that. Anything else? Okay, we've heard from the board and the public. We're then done with item number 13. That's not an action item. Got to report. Thank you, Alex, for your work and, and your Thank clarity you. on what's going on. Um, item number 14 on our agenda is the um, basically uh, recommended approval of Metro's fiscal year 21 22 draft operating budgets and fiscal 21, uh, fiscal year 21 capital budget, along with a resolution setting a public hearing for June 26th. Uh, I'm not going to steal all of uh, Angela's uh, thunder here, but I do want to say that we understand that this budget is a, basically a placeholding budget. We don't have enough information about our revenues and other issues to be able to do a budget we have great confidence in, but we can't make any claims for funding if we don't sort of keep moving ahead with this budget and approving it at the various levels. So Angela, you're on. Good morning. So um, instead of calling it a placeholding budget, I want to call it a pre-COVID budget because this is the budget that we would have put forward um, if uh, COVID would not have happened. And so um, usually I go through all my slides and, and go through each, each thing that's going on, but because um, it is pre-COVID and there's a lot of stuff in here that's going to change dramatically, but we do have to adopt a budget by June 30th. I would like to skip to slide nine. Which on the presentation is slide small numbers fifty eight. Thank you. Yep. There we go. All right. So what I'm showing you here is uh, we had the March budget ready to go, and then we did not have a March meeting. So you guys saw this budget in April, and then uh, we've made some changes. I've listed three things there. Um, because of what we know is going on with the COVID service with UCSC, uh, we had put a 2% escalator in there and that it, we had taken that out and that would have been $90,000 on the revenue side. We also got a new number from RTC, which brought down our TDA LTF funds by $539,000. So we've incorporated that into these main numbers. And then on the good side, we did get a uh, lease contract with uh, uh, Netflix, it was supposed to be $2,000 a month, but they're not running either. So uh, we put it in there just so uh, in case things do start coming back starting July 1st, we do have that in the budget. Move on to the next slide. Next slide is the operating expenses. So the only change on the operating expenses, uh, we've decided to uh, lease 14 buses and there are 14 CNG buses. Uh, what we can do is <clears throat> capital money to lease on the principal side of that lease, but the interest um, on that lease has to be on the operating side. So that's what the $136,000 and $150,000 increase is from the March budget to the, May, to the May budget. And then the next slide, 
There we go. This is, um, we got an increase in SGR money. And so what this slide is showing you is the budget has, or the board has to, committed to a $3 million always going into the capital budget to sustain our um, buying of, of the buses and the fleet. And to do that, we use different pots of money. And so uh, we got an increase in our SGR money allocation. What, is, what does SGR stand for? Yeah. Sorry. State of good repair. Sorry. <laughs> I was focused on something else. State of good repair money. The allocations for state of good repair money uh, was increased. And so we were able to use less of our quote unquote own money to make that transfer of $3 million happen. So that's why it's it's a positive $769,000 and $887,000 going into 21. So then the next slide I wanna jump to is, find the number, number 65, please. There we go. So this is our little bucket slide. And um, this is actually changed since we put this together for May. Um, I'll talk about a couple changes that we're going to have uh, going into the June budget. But the metal bucket there, uh, we are actually going to bring that back up to the target of 7.5. So we will have that in there in June. And uh, May 8th uh, was a different story as this stuff changes almost every day. And then on the operating capital reserve side, we are going to have some money left in there yet. I just don't know what it is. So this is, was our, our snapshot on May 8th but this snapshot of these reserves, our guesstimate or our crystal ball for June 30th uh, will be a little bit different and actually more positive when we get down to um, putting forward the June budget in a month. So let's go to the next slide. Going on to the operating risk and budgets, budget risk that we have going on. Um, this is always something that we have, but we actually added uh, a few things in here uh, that are COVID related as well as service related. So as uh, most of you know, we went to zero fixed route and paratransit fares starting in April, 2020. So no more um, uh, passenger fare revenue until you know the immediate future right now. Special transit fares, uh, we've reduced our trips almost down to 98% of the ridership in April, 2020. Uh, UCSC Cabrillo and the city of Santa Cruz, those contracts are either being eliminated or severely cut. On the sales tax side, this is very much a big swag. Um, right now I'm saying 50 to 80% reduced sales tax receipts. I know the state came out and said a 27% reduction on their side of sales tax from a state level, but uh, we do have a little bit more um, fluid money that comes through here. And uh, my guesstimate right now is a 50 to 80% reduction in that sales tax. May 22nd, I believe, is when we're gonna get our first sales tax number that will reflect the whole month of March and the kind of sales tax that we did receive versus what we are expecting to, to receive. So that's gonna give us a pretty in good indication of what probably happened in April and probably happened in May since everything pretty much shut down starting in March. Um, Let's see what else. The federal FTA and alternative fuel tax, those are things that we always have out there as a risk. Next page on the expenses. Oops, one more. Uh oh. Slide 68. Thank you, Gina. There we go. Okay, so on the expense side, uh, the top part of this are the normal things that we have out there, um, engine failures, fuel costs, workers' comp insurance, things like that. But the ones that uh, we've added are towards the bottom, starting with changes in unfunded mandates. So we were very fortunate in getting that CARES Act. There was a um, um, significant amount of money that we will be receiving. We haven't received it yet. As Alex told you, it's reimbursable. So the $20 million will help us tremendously to get through the next few months. But um, we have some overtime that we are incurring that we would not have been incurring because of the COVID crisis and the response that we've had to that. Uh, we also have um, expenses that we're incurring above and beyond that 20 million um, that we're receiving on the CARES Act. So we have to think about those costs. And then um, I'm gonna read this one, delay in cutting expenses to new revenue reality, including the CARES Act 20 million. And what I mean by that is, you know, we're, we are trying to be very, very cautious about the costs that we cut. Because Alex has said numerous times, 
If we start cutting service and then we have to bring that service back, it's not going to come back quickly. It's gonna take months for us to bring that service back. So we wanna be very cautious about what expenses we cut in anticipation of what we think the revenues are gonna to be to cover those expenses. And then the biggest one is more government mandates for employee paid leaves that are not reimbursable. Right now, um, you have some of those leaves, some of the new leaves that are reimbursable through the CARES Act and some other um, reimbursement means. But there may be some mandates that come out from either local, state, or federal government that's, that mandate us to do something, and there's no money to cover it. So we would have to uh, find a way within our budget to cover those additional expenses. Let's see. Here. So the next one, Jim. Uh, Gina says. Angela, can I interrupt at this point just to ask? Do we know sure. anything about those three bills that were going through the state legislature that were? Uh, promising to like, you know, it doesn't matter us in the short term because we're not charging fares anyway, but that we're going to basically, um, you know, free free rides for uh, college students and other those kinds of issues. I think they've been delayed. Yeah, they 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 the next year is what Alex said, yeah. all three of them. So nothing to help us right now. Okay, thank you. Can yeah. I ask one other question here? Um, Bruce. You, you said the next, uh, you'll have a sales tax uh, realistic um, uh, if, well uh, receipts on that on June 22nd will that okay. will you have that updated and ready for us on our June 26th meeting so we get a better realistic view of what's going on so May 22nd next week I will have actual sales tax numbers for the month of March and then in June I'm crossing my fingers before our June 26th meeting I think it is I will have actual numbers for April um, but we will start, when we get those numbers in March, I think that's going to be a pretty good indication of what we sh would expect to see in April and May, because not a whole lot has changed between when everything shut down around here in March and what is continuing to happen. So uh, May 22nd, June 20 something is when I think those things are going to be coming through. That answer your question? He'd ask whether by the 26th you would have time to process that in order to give us a report. Um, verbally, but uh, Gina needs her reports a week before, so not not in writing, but I can verbally tell you what's going to be going on with uh, um, the sales tax actuals that we receive for the month of March and April. Thank you. That's fine. That's uh, That'd be wonderful. All right. Back to your report. Sorry, I interrupted you. No problem. So let's move on to slide number 76, please. So this is our capital budget. As most of you know, we do a one-year capital budget. We do a two-year operating budget. This capital budget is a little different than prior years. It has absolutely no brand new capital projects. What this money is, is uh, projects that we've either already started or we haven't finished in the current fiscal year. And we're moving that money forward into fiscal year 21. And so this is the um, uh, projected revenues, right? Yes. Yes, this is the revenues in the next slide. It is what we'll be uh, buying. So revenue, uh, van purchases, um, replacement campaigns, constructions, IT projects, facility upgrades. Those are kind of our big guys. On to the next slide. Whoops. One back. One back. Oh, we're missing it. I don't know. Okay, well, I guess I'll just talk to it. So in your packet, you'll have another slide and it says uh, slide number 78 is the budget timeline. And what it will tell you is that uh, we started this back in February. Uh, we were supposed to go to the board in March. We actually went in April. And then uh, we're going to you in May. This is what we would call the draft budget. Usually this time of year, we're ready to go. There's um, not a whole lot of changes that we would include uh, going forward into the June budget. But this year, as we all know, it's it's very different. So that's why I'm calling this the pre-COVID budget. Um, a lot of things are gonna change. 
between now and as we get into uh, July and August of this year, but we do have to have a board adopted budget by June 30th. And so that's the purpose of this budget. Uh, the changes going forward into the June budget and month from now, when we present the final budget that would, I would need you to adopt before June 30th, we have a couple FTEs uh, that we're going to be um, uh, finalizing. We had some ideas of which ones there, but now we have the final numbers. Uh, the two contracts that you approved today, we'll be putting those uh, um, operating numbers into the budget too. So any questions? Are there any questions? I don't see any hands. All right, thank you very much. Wait, any members of the public with a question? Oh, John Leopold has a question. John, go ahead. Uh, Angela, uh, thanks for the presentation. I know this is, uh, this is a very difficult time to try to figure out, uh, to forecast effectively, as right. Alex pointed out in his earlier uh, piece. Uh, I'm trying to uh, figure out, um, you know, I'm glad that we uh, did the hard work in terms of refilling our reserves uh, in all those buckets. So seeing, so seeing the slide that we're that we're going to be fully funded in in, in those res, uh, buckets um, is a good thing. But uh, obviously, as we've seen, I know at the county we're taking a look at this. And when we saw the state May budget revise, they looked about using those reserves over a period of time. Have you started thinking about that? And you know, what are your thoughts? Thinking in my head, nothing I'm ready to share. <laughs> um, we, we have a lot of strategizing to do. Uh, there's a lot of big unknowns. Uh, the sales tax number is, is the biggest one I'm waiting on. I mean, if, if that thing comes through at say the 27% that the governor thinks, then we'd be in pretty good shape. We can figure things out. But if it comes in at the 50 to 80% that I'm envisioning, which I really hope I'm wrong, um, we got a lot of things that we're going to have to have some hard decisions on. And I can't stand here and tell you it's going to be in a certain area. It's going to be in a, a certain uh, department. It's going to be um, a lot of different areas with a lot of different conversations. Yeah, I know at the county, we got a presentation just this past Tuesday, uh, looking out at our next budget and the uh, estimate that we were using just as the placeholder, because there's so much unknown, is a 45% uh, decrease in TOT and an annual 25% decrease in uh, sales tax, if I remember correctly. Uh, 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 Supervisor McPherson could correct me if I'm remembering that incorrectly, but, uh, but, we're, but even that <clears throat> is uh, devastating uh, to the county budget. So if you're, if you're right and it's closer to 50 or 80%, um, that would be catastrophic. Obviously. Yeah. See, we have a lot more uh, revenues. I mean, sales tax obviously is our biggest revenue, but we have multiple revenues that are sales tax based or even sure, diesel sure. sales tax based. So because- No, and then that's the same way for the county. There's a whole <laughs> bunch of uh, public safety, health and human services, realignment right. dollars that are all connected to the sales tax figures. Right. And then you add on top of that, the contracts that we have with UCSC Cabrillo, I mean, those are big money for us. And so having that service not being provided and we can only charge for service provided. I think the example I used the other day is um, we had $300,000 or $325,000 a month is what we should be receiving with all the service that we have been providing. And I believe it was April where we went down to about 1,100 trips. And so that, that went from $325,000 a month to a little over 100,000 a month. That's a lot of money in one month. And if that even goes down more, it you got to include it all. And that's where my 50 to 80 comes from. Yeah. Well, uh, good luck keeping all your hair <laughs> pulling it all out. No, a couple things.
So Ian, um, you might have to let all the attendees in like you did at the start of the meeting because I'm showing zero on the attendees side. Mike, you're muted. Mike, you're muted, Mike. James put his hand up and James has his hand up. He's back online. Yeah, I'm going to get to him. I'm, I was just about to say, sorry, let me, uh, this should be there now. And and I had uh, my hand up too. You're back. So, I, I, so I started with, um, Aurelio had his hand up. He was number one and then Cynthia, and then we'll get to James. I, I know he wants to speak. Aurelio, did you still have a comment? No, no, go ahead. Let me add before we go further, this budget was recommended by the uh, Finance Committee unanimously. Uh, and so that's the item before us. I'm taking any other comments from board members. And so next, who, who was it that wanted to speak? Matthews. Cynthia, go yeah. ahead. Yeah, um, I appreciate that it's pre-COVID subject to enormous change. And Angela, you mentioned you're been, going to be getting some figures. To, I don't know how the others feel, but um, I would appreciate even some just updates. They don't even have to be a formal report or anything, but as you're getting this information, it would just be help the, help us <laughs> wrap our heads around all this. Um, yeah, Alex and I will coordinate yeah, uh, getting information out to you. Um, because I know you'll send some stuff to finance, et cetera, but just, I think we all want to be as much in the loop without a burden on you guys, but yeah. occasionally would be helpful. Yeah, I think um, Alex and I will, will coordinate and uh, as soon as we find something out, he'll probably um, contact you, whatever process yeah, he uses. Just, just contact you. whatever, yeah. Thank yeah. you. And then at the board meetings, if there's something above and beyond than what's in the budget, we'll probably just do some kind of oral presentation. Um, as Director McPherson said that he wanted some information about the May 22nd and June yeah, numbers. exactly. That's kind of what I'm thinking. Yeah, we'll just talk to it. Um, any other member of the board with a comment? Uh, Mike, can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Okay, I don't know what happened. Yeah, I, I thought you, I thought uh, you guys. Our didn't... host apparently got scheduled, was automatically went to another meeting and left us in the dark, but we're back. <laughs> okay, um, I, I uh, we had some retirements and I uh, really like the promotions and so forth. But if somebody leaves now, and I understand the difficulty in getting somebody, getting the position filled if we lay off somebody, but if somebody leaves, at this point, are we leaving that position vacant or are we uh, initiating hiring as usual? That's the question. Uh, so Bruce, like um, focusing right now, well, we're, we're, we're analyzing current vacancies across the board to answer that exact question. Okay. On the bus operator side right now, uh, any vacancies are being held vacant. We're not, we're not planning to run a new class anytime in the near future until this dust settles out a little bit. Okay. I think it's fair to say the district, for the reasons Alex laid out, but in general, doing our best to not lay people off or we can avoid it, we, but we may come to that point, I think, as he said, in full transparency. And James and I have spoken about this. No question that things may be going there, but we'll do our best to be sensitive to the needs of our employees and not capriciously be or uh, precipitously laying people off when, we, when it's a, uh, not a good decision. So, James, you're now on if you'd like to make a comment. Did he get back on the call? I don't see his name. He's on. James, if you can hear me, you can start whenever you're ready. Hit your space bar. You're still muted, James. Have to hold the space bar. Can we unmute him on our side? No, he has to unmute himself. 
There you go. James, go ahead. Can you guys hear me? There we go. A little louder, please. Uh, Okay. I thought you guys booted me because I raised my hand. I'm glad everybody else talked. (laughs) (laughs) Please get closer to James. Get closer to your mic. It's hard to hear you. Um, first, I wanted to say great presentation, Angela, and also thank you for answering most of our questions before presenting it to the board. I did. Uh, I'm curious to see if uh, you guys got that or you got that final number on how much the operator saved by restructuring our bid. Not yet. Christine is still crunching that. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Yes, as, as people are, I think, aware, we've saved a great deal of money in overtime because we've uh, this is for the public that are unaware of it. I think most board members know this, but we're on an AB shift uh, where people work for two weeks on and uh, on call basically at home for the next two weeks. And when people are on call, we call them up to come and fill in when we need folks. And so we're not, we don't have as much demand for overtime as we, there's a little bit left, but very little left. And thanks to the drivers for that situation, because that, that's a source of income for drivers. They are a lot of them depend upon the overtime and they're, they're basically not getting any of that now. So they're being hit by that in a in real way as individual drivers. But go ahead, James, any other comments? No, that was it, thank you. Thank you for your comments. Any other members of the public with a comment for us? No more hands. All right, thank you very much. We are on now on to, we need to approve this budget. And so um, I'm looking for a motion. Wait, Mike, we need Wait. a motion on this to start the public hearing and everything? That's what I just said. Oh, I'll move the item, Mrs. Donna. by Donna Meyer's motion, second by Aurelio. Get that? Okay, any other comments? Any other comments from members of the public? Then we'll have a roll call vote, please. Dr. Botsworth? Aye. Dr. Kaplan Gomez? Aye. Dr. Gonzalez? Aye. Dr. Leopold? Aye. Dr. Lynn? Aye. Dr. Matthews? Aye. Dr. McPherson? Aye. Dr. Or, excuse me, Dr. Myers? Aye. Dr. Pegler? Aye. Dr. Rothwell? You're muted, Dan. Sorry. Aye. Dr. Rotkin. Aye. Unanimous. Carries unanimously. Okay. Uh, we are now on to item number 15. Uh, this is a demonstration of the Metro's new mobile ticketing application for Highway 17 service. And uh, Ginger Dicar is there's both a misspelling of her last name. There's no R after the D. And she works for the Regional Transportation Commission, not the city of Santa Cruz, which is an error in our... Uh, 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 Mr. Yeah. Mr. Chair, uh, let's see. Are we on? We're on item 15, I believe. Uh, Ginger would Correct. be on item 16. So we're on item 15. And John Irgo, our new uh, no, planning okay. director, yeah, will introduce that item. You're right. I jumped ahead. I'm sorry. That's all right. Okay. John, are you coming on? I don't see him here. I don't see a microphone listed for him. Okay. Is he in your office or at home or where is he? We're going to find out right now. Yeah. One of the challenging things okay, we do John. while we're waiting is I had a landscaper coming around not realizing I was on the deck. So I moved quickly out of the way and then we lost the Zoom. So I thought that was me. We all, we all dropped off. We, we all thought it was something we did, but it was a system I real, problem. I realized it, but it was funny when you see a, a landscaper with a big blower and a mask and you're standing here on the deck going, okay, <laughs> something new with Zoom. Uh, good morning, directors. John Argo, uh, planning and development director. Luckily, I didn't have to travel far uh, to get here. Um, this is an informational item, an update on our mobile ticketing pilot. Um, for some of you who may remember, the uh, board issued the release of a request for proposals last spring. We awarded to Masabi um, in the summer, and the original plan was to launch 
in March of this year. Obviously, that was disrupted uh, by COVID-19. Um, and we are now looking at uh, launching in the summer or fall, depending on the resumption of fair collection. Um, this whole crisis has also emphasized the importance of contactless uh, payment in our system. And I'm going to uh, turn it over to Pete Rasmussen, who is a transportation planner here and the project manager for this. And he's going to go through the demonstration. So do we have his presentation? OK, great. He's here. Pete, raise your hand and they will open your mic. Yeah, he should be. Yeah, Pete, he's on. Pete, I think you're on. Go. Okay. Uh, I don't see the presentation. Okay. There it is, Pete. All right. Um, good morning, Chairman and Board members. My name is Pete Rasmussen. I'm a transportation planner for Metro. I've been asked to do a mobile ticketing overview and demonstration. As John said, we were tantalizingly close to launching in March when the coronavirus hit and we suspended fares. But I'd like to give you a view of what's to come at some point later this year. Next slide, please. Actually, the next, there we go. Um, so let me start with some background. Metro's current fare equipment was installed eight, installed eight to eight, nine years ago, and it is showing its age. From Metro's perspective, there have been issues with reliability of ticket vending machines and other equipment. From a customer perspective, customers want convenience, but unfortunately, our fare options are not convenient. A customer that wants a 31-day pass has to go to a transit center or has to wait for a pass to come in the mail. These days, people are used to making purchases online. Customers want to be able to add path value to their cruise passes online too, but that capability isn't available. In 2018, we explored a full fare system replacement, but it was out of reach in terms of cost. We decided to scale back to a limited pilot with mobile ticketing on Highway 17 Express. Mobile ticketing was the right fit because it can be added on without having to rip out any existing equipment. It also has the benefit of bringing the ability to purchase a ticket anywhere that the customer has their phone and an internet connection. Highway 17 Express is a good fit for the pilot because the ridership includes a lot of college students and Silicon Valley commuters, both groups which are avid smartphone users. Um, as John mentioned, an RFP was issued and Masabi was selected as the vendor. Masabi calls their product fare collection as a service because instead of a large upfront capital cost, the payment is a monthly fee and percentage of fair revenue collected. They also make it possible to start with the simplest product, mobile ticketing, and then progressively add more features in a phased approach. Next slide, please. A lot of customers have told us through emails and surveys that they don't typically carry cash. They pay for everything they can with their credit or debit card. And it's hard to get more convenient than being able to purchase and carry your pass on your phone, as most of us carry it with us wherever we go. For Metro, a significant benefit is expected to be faster boarding time on the Highway 17 Express as it takes time to feed in $7 in bills or even change. And for riders that purchase a 15 ride or 31 day pass every month, it's especially convenient as frequently purchased passes are stored for a quick repurchase in just a few quick taps. Next slide. So this next slide shows an example of one of our marketing posters that will be used to promote the product once we're closer to launch. We're calling it the Metro Splash Pass to give it a, some local character. And this poster highlights the ability to purchase a ticket anywhere, anytime, and that the app is available for both iPhones and Android phones. Next, I'll show you the app itself. Next slide. This shows the splash or welcome screen that pops up briefly when you first open the app, showing the Metro logo and the Just Ride logo. Just Ride is Masabi's brand name for the product. Next slide. This is the home screen, like the home page of a website. The Buy Passes button, as the name suggests, is where you would click to purchase a ticket. My Passes is your ticket wallet that stores tickets that you've already purchased, ready to be activated later. And in that gold color, you'll see top tickets, 
that's where if you always <laughs> have a certain type of pass, that will show up in the top tickets area for greater convenience. Trip Tools is another screen, uh, it takes you to another screen that links to online schedules, Google Trip Planner, and other info such as the Metro Rider's Guide and Bike Policy. The Help button takes you, as you would guess, to customer service, an FAQ, and terms and conditions. Next, I'll walk you through a purchase. Next slide. Select fare type. From the home screen, you would click bypasses and that would take you to this select a fare type screen. From here, you would either select full fare or discount fare, depending on whether you're an eligible customer for discount. Next slide. On this screen, you'll see that all of the Highway 17 fares are available. Um, you can select a one ride fare or day pass if you're an occasional rider, or for more frequent riders, you might opt for a 15 ride or 31 day pass. You'll see on the right, it says multiple. You have the option to purchase more than one ticket at a time. So a person could purchase for themselves and a spouse or a child or a friend. So you'd click on one of the fare types and then go on to the next screen. Next slide. In the interest of time, I did skip ahead a couple of screens to the confirmation page, bypassing the, the billing info, but I assure you that it's a quite simple and quick process. But I wanted to move on to the activation part of the process. Next slide. Once you've got your ticket in, in the uh, ticket wallet, um, or once you purchase the pass, it's in this ticket wallet. You can purchase in advance so that it's ready to go once you head out to the bus stop. A key feature from our vendor is that you can purchase the ticket when you're at home or wherever else you have internet access. And then the activation, which needs to occur just before boarding, can be done offline in case you're boarding in an area with poor cell phone coverage. From the ticket wallet, you select a ticket and then it will prompt you to activate that ticket. Next slide. And that activation screen is shown here. You, you would click on the green bar. It actually brings up another screen that asks if, you, <clears throat> if you're sure you, like, you wanna activate, and then you proceed and it generates your ticket. Next slide. <clears throat> excuse me, um, and that ticket is shown here. This is just a picture, not a live demo, so I can't show you, but the ticket actually has a number of animated features. And no, I'm not talking about Toy Story or Frozen or Cars. There are elements of the screen that are dynamic. That 11.19 a.m. time that you see there would continuously update and it would scroll back and forth from the left to the right. The tricolored bar behind that switches colors at various times through the day. And that square QR code that you see above the ticket is also dynamic. These are all security measures designed to make it difficult to fake a ticket. I should add here that there's more than one way to enforce the validity of a ticket. The most common way is for operators to visually verify. That's the method used by most of the over 100 transit properties that have mobile ticketing. It's the easiest to start with since it doesn't require any installation of hardware. It does, however, place more burden on the operator to know how to properly identify a ticket. And significantly in this age of the coronavirus, it also means that customers have to step up close enough for the operator to see the screen. Next slide. The other way to validate it, uh, actually back one. There you go, thank you. The other way to validate a ticket is to is by using an electronic validator. For those of you that have used Clipper in the Bay Area or fair systems in other major cities, it's common to see these standalone validators apart from the fare box, and they generally look somewhat like this. With the electronic validator, the customer would put their phone up close to the middle section, and it would read the QR code, similar to a boarding pass at the airport, with both the visual and audio confirmation. If you look at the bottom of this picture, you'll see what looks like a credit card with a symbol on it. That lower section has the capability to read multiple types of cards. One of those is smart cards, which would be plastic cards like our current cruise cards. But unlike our cruise cards, these could be reloaded online. Uh, there are also some other interesting capabilities of this validator. <clears throat> Next slide. Um, so next, I'd like to talk about future capabilities. These may not be in place right away, but I wanted to give a preview. 
In addition to the transit specific cards, such as cruise passes or clipper, these validators also have the capability to read what's referred to as contactless EMV. If you've received a new credit card recently, there's a good chance it is a contactless card. They're the ones that you can simply put up close to the credit card reader rather than inserting the chip or swiping. It's still new in the US, but it's been very common in Europe for years, and it's a very popular way to pay for transit there. You don't need to carry exact change, you don't need to purchase a pass in advance, and you don't even need to download an app. Apple Pay and Google Pay are also feature options, just tap the phone to pay. And then there's the UCSC One Card. Sorry about that, my phone. <laughs> Uh, UCSC One Card. UCSC has been asking for years whether we could combine the UCSC student ID or staff ID with a Metro card that can be tapped so that the operator doesn't have to push a button for every boarding. And when someone leaves the university, their pass can be switched off. It will take some time to iron out the details, but I can say that other Masabi customers have already deployed this, combining a student ID and transit into a One Card. Next slide. Now, some of you may be thinking, this sounds great, but what if someone doesn't have a credit or debit card? That's a good question, or tends to pay with cash. There are a few options to address that. Someone can use cash to purchase a prepaid debit card. They're available at most supermarkets and drugstores. Some employers offer payroll in the form of a debit card account, and disability insurance from the state is paid that way. Wasabi is also working on a retail network option in which a customer could purchase a transit card directly from a gift, rack, gift card rack at say Safeway or CVS and pay with cash at the check stand. Next slide. So with this new system, if all goes well with the vendor, there are capabilities that don't exist with our current fare collection that allow for some potential adjustments to fare policy that might be worth considering. Some of you may recall that transit agencies used to offer free transfers with a paper slip given to the rider. For the most part, that's been abandoned in part due to a lot of fraud with those transfer slips. With this new system, customers would use phones or reusable cards rather than the disposable paper slips, so it's less likely to happen. The system keeps track of when a fare is activated, so a transfer can be, be allowed within a set amount of time. One fare policy that many transit properties have been, begun to adopt is fare capping, also known as best fares. It is designed so the transit rider <clears throat> who does not want to commit to the entire amount of a 31-day pass <clears throat> can pay as they go by purchasing single fares each trip. Generally, after a certain number of rides in a day, uh, generally two or three, it becomes a day pass and additional rides are not charged. After a certain number of uses in a month, any remaining rides are not charged, it converts to a 31 day or monthly pass. It is viewed as a customer friendly fare policy because it simplifies fares and doesn't require a large upfront purchase to get multi-ride discounts. These changes would not only require having this new fare system across the fixed route system, but it would also require a change to the Metro fare policy should the board choose to go that direction. Next slide. Can I ask a question before you move on? Sure. Um, isn't the purpose of having a discount for buying a, a monthly pass or a 31 day pass that we get the money up front and therefore it's worth it to us to give you a discount? Why should someone be rewarded who buys daily passes when they get to this other level? All we're doing is cutting our revenues. What am I missing? Uh, I mean, well, it, that's, it's a benefit for the customer, I get that, but it yeah. comes at the expense of yeah. our bottom line and our ability to provide service to the public. That's a, that's a question for finance. I think usually it's more of kind of a loyalty discount um, rather than trying to increase our revenue by getting money up front and being able to put it directly into the bank. Okay. John or Alex, do you have anything to add to that? We don't need to resolve that now. I just think that's a consideration because mm -hmm. we're not we're not about to implement this. But when we get back to it, I think it'd be an important question. And Mike, uh, just real quick on that point, Mike, can you hear me? 
Yes, I hear you fine. Yeah, one of the reasons why you implement a best fares type of program is that you, you do have a constituency that I'll just call the poorest of the poor. And they, their paychecks, their income come in over the course of the month. They, they don't have the financial wherewithal to buy the product that's best for them, which is the monthly pass, because it takes such a large outlay of money at the beginning of the month to buy that product. They don't have that money. And so what Best Ferris does is it allows them to have the net same effect because as they write our system uh, over the course of the month, they start working their way up towards qualifying for that, say that 31 day pass, and then they get the benefit of the 31 day pass without having to fork over the money at the beginning of the month. Do people have to declare their interest in the 31 day pass before they get part of that? Or is it just anybody who eventually gets a certain number of daily passes gets one of these 31 day benefits? No, this is John Argo. It would it would be automatic as they as they go through the month. Thank you. You can go on the report. Thank you. Okay. Um, next slide, please. So finally, the roadmap for implementation. Uh, this summer, staff will bring to the board a codified tariff, which will incorporate a lot of disparate changes to the fare policy that have occurred over time, and will incorporate language for mobile ticketing. Once fare collection is eventually resumed. There's the option for a soft launch of mobile ticketing this summer using visual validation, which I explained earlier. However, staff's recommended route is to go straight to electronic validation because of its many benefits. There may be a hardware cost of up to $40,000 for the 20 bus Highway 17 fleet, but Metro is also pursuing a potential partnership that would cover some of that cost. Going the validator route directly would take longer to start, so that would be a fall launch, but it would provide an opportunity to evaluate right away whether this is the fair system that will, that will meet our needs for the longer term. Looking into 2021, if all goes well with the Highway 17 pilot, then we would expand to the full local fixed route fleet. Thank you for your time, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. That was a very clear and uh, interesting report. Any questions from board members or comments? I see Larry with a hand up. Uh, yeah, Pete, if you're still there, my question would be, have you had a chance to review the uh, Just Ride app with our disabled community? Uh, any introduction of new tr technology has to address certain issues of accessibility. And I just wonder if you've had an opportunity to do that review yet? I have not yet, but I have um, asked them about uh, like an, an audio version for someone who's visually impaired, and that does exist. But I Thanks. will take note to reach out to that community. Great, thank you. Trina had a question. You're still muted, Trina. Ah. Um, my question was, is there a possibility to do the auto pay every month if we've got regular users and they've set it up to do it electronically? Um, I believe so, but I, I would have to check to confirm that. Generally, things are pretty automated with this system, but I, I'm not 100% certain. Maybe you could get back to her if you look that up and figure okay. that out. John Leopold. Uh, thanks. Thanks for the presentation. I know this is something that will be um, th that people will sort of expect that we have that they will use. And I'm wondering uh, with um, it, it would be great during this time where we don't have a lot uh, of service to see if we could expedite some of these pieces um, to so when people are are coming back to our service that we have these tools in place. Waiting till spring 2021 seems like a long time. And I'm wondering if there's anything we could do to speed that up. Um, uh, so thinking around the first of the year or sometime sooner as people are returning to our, our system uh, that this tool is already available. Mm -hmm. Well, the original schedule for the Highway 17 pilot was to uh, do that for 12 months um, using visual validation and then consider the electronic validators and expanding to the full system. 
Um, so actually what we're looking at now is already to accelerate it. But of course, um, depending on if things are going great, then I see no reason not to accelerate it. I, I agree with you that um, the sooner that we can roll this out and provide these new benefits would be better. Um, rolling it out to the full system with validators, of course, that does in involve um, installation of hardware and, and that can that can be um, a bit more time consuming. Yeah, I'm just thinking that uh, for the next couple of months, we may have less buses on the road. And mm -hmm. is, is there, it, can we can we take advantage of that time by not having all of our fleet out every day to to install that uh, hardware and and make that work so we could so we can move this forward. That would depend on whether we find out that it can be done. Um, the installation can be done in house. Um, I understand that um, there's part of the delay on our AVL implementation and the eventual real time app is that the installation of that product was handled by an outside vendor and that's had to be put on hold. Um, due to the shelter in place and not bringing in outside people other than Metro employees. So well, that may you, play into that. But um, if, if things are loosened and we're able to bring in people, uh, that is something definitely to explore. Yeah, I mean, that was my next uh, question is uh, about AVL. I mean, wouldn't it be great by the first of the year, we'd say you, you, you can uh, pay with your phone and you'll be able to use your phone to know where the bus is, I think. As mm -hmm. as we as we move people, as as people are are more engaged, hopefully we're uh, there's a lot less restrictions by January one that we have this new tool, and I think we're going to have to work to get people to come back to uh, mass transit uh, mm -hmm. because uh, there's going to be a lot of concerns, and any tool that we can use uh, to make that easier will help us in that transition. So. If, the, if we can take advantage of that time, that's what I want to encourage as, as much as possible. Thank okay. you. Thanks yeah, for the thank you for that comment. And um, by the way, you, you uh, reminded me of something that I um, forgot to mention, and that's that um, with Masabi, they have a way to integrate with the transit app, which is um, a very popular transit app used worldwide, a uh, variety of different transit systems in Las Vegas and Denver, you can pull up that transit app, um, look up your bus schedule, plan your trip, and then directly click one button and it takes you to the mobile ticketing app. So you don't even need to go to a separate app to purchase your fare. Um, that's a, a very nifty feature that I'm excited about. But let me just add, as somebody who used Highway 17 a great deal in the last couple of years, um, you have no idea how critical and important this is. To wait, it sometimes take 10 or 15 minutes to load a bus at Deirdre Station. As people get on the bus, I was carrying like $40 in ones because people needed, you know, like get on and say, you know, I don't have change. And they would, and there'd be these arguments with the bus driver. Do I, I don't want to give you my $10 bill or I don't, you know, I have a $20 bill. Mm -hmm. I need change. Or people say like, I don't even, I didn't know it was going to have to pay cash for this. I, I don't know what to do. And we'd stand there, there'd be these arguments and lines of people and stuff and people trying to see if could they borrow money and so forth. So this is something we need to put in place as quickly as we can. At least the idea that people don't need to bring $7 in, in exact change. It was a terrible situation. Mm -hmm. And it made the ride 15 minutes longer. I mean, there's no that by the time of it, a long day over the hill, you definitely ready to come home. You don't want to be sitting there waiting for people to find their money. Not all in. And, and just echoing what Ben said, even though there's some expense yeah. in the long run, I think it's going to particularly now, uh, it would anyway, but particularly now, uh, pay for itself. Any other comments or questions? Thanks for that report. It uh, sounds like something really positive. Alex had a comment. Or... Gina has a comment. Actually, yeah. Director Kaufman Gomez has a question. Would there be a, an auto pay option for the regular users? Um, yeah, that question came up yeah. earlier and um, I'm gonna have to look into that and get back to the board. Thank you. Okay, great. So I think we're done with item number 15. We're now under item 16. Um, and this is again the. Uh, Mike, did you the, want to go to the public? I'm sorry. Yeah, I should have asked for it. Do the any members of the public want to comment on this uh, uh, new app 
situation that we're developing. Thanks for that reminder. Doesn't look like we have anybody. I got one hand. One hand. Uh, James. James, you have a comment? You have to unmute yourself, James. There you go. All right. I just wanted to mention that we have a great opportunity here with this mobile ticketing app, with uh, the public becoming more tech savvy with all of these Zoom meetings and and uh, them being more conscious about viruses and germs, maybe with cash that um, you know we capitalize by trying to expedite this mobile ticketing to promote it as an alternative, you know, safer alternative than cash. So, uh, you know, as bus operators, we totally support this. Great, thanks James. Anyone else? Apparently not. Okay, now we're at item number 16. Uh, it's an update on the transit corridor alternatives. Let me just introduce this briefly by saying uh, we're, there's planning going on to um, determine what would be the best mode of transit to operate on the, for public transit along the rail corridor that runs the 32 miles through the county. And uh, it's a joint project at this point of the transit district and the regional transportation commission. We have overlap in members. Um, and we're going through various phases of this. And the first phase now is to have try to select uh, out of a large number, I think it's 16 or 17 possible, even maybe more uh, options to reduce this to a smaller number to have serious consideration and serious qu uh, quantitative study of which is would be the best mode for us to carry out. I'm going to turn this over to our planning director and guys uh, take it from here. Thank you, Director Ed. John Ergo again, planning and development director. That's pretty much the introduction I was going to give to this item. Um, Oops, sorry. <laughs> that's, that's perfect. Uh, Metro's, Metro staff has been working with uh, RTC on this transit corridor alternatives analysis, and we've invited Ginger Dykar, uh, senior transportation planner with RTC, to give an update on milestone two, uh, which, as you said, is this narrowing down of all the alternatives into into four that will be studied further. So, Ginger, if you want to raise your hand uh, and unmic yourself, and we'll load your presentation. You're still, you're still, there you, there you go. Welcome. Can you hear Julia. me? Yes. Yes, we hear you fine. Okay, fantastic. Good morning, Metro Board, Ginger Dykar, tra transportation planner on the RTC staff, and also the project manager for the transit corridor alternatives analysis. Uh, it seemed like um, between Mike and John, we've, um, you got me started here, so I know we don't have a lot of time today, so I'll just keep going. Um, but I do want to say it's been a great um, overlap between Metro staff and RTC staff working together on this project. I think we've got a good rapport going. We also have the consultants, HDR engineering, that have been a great um, team. It's a large team of people that have been working on this project and I think it's going pretty well. Uh, next slide, please. I'll just kind of a reminder of the, the various steps of this analysis. It's depicted on the right there. Um, first, we start out with the initial list of alternatives. We then use the high level screening criteria to reduce these down to a short list of alternatives. And then from there, we'll have a more quantitative analysis utilizing the performance measures that were developed in the first milestone to then narrow down to a locally preferred alternative. So where we are right now and what we're seeking your input on today is the short list of alternatives. And we will be, um, we have drafted these, uh, provided this information to uh, many, many stakeholders and we'll be bringing this um, recommendation to the RTC board on June 4th. Um, let's see, uh, yeah, next slide. So the, the initial list of alternatives that have been considered are shown here on these next six, no, the next uh, three slides. This is all of the uh, rubber wheeled options. As you can see, there's the local bus, a commuter express bus. Uh, we also have the bus rapid transit option on the top uh, middle, as well as an autonomous road train. That's a, uh, calling it a train is actually a little bit of a misnomer. It is a, a rubber wheeled vehicle on pavement. And then the other two options uh, that are uh, associated with a bus is uh, the dual rail and bus vehicle, as well as micro shuttles. Next slide, please. 
The rail options that we've evaluated through the screening is uh, an inner city rail, commuter rail, uh, electric um, local rail, as well as a, a diesel local rail, and then the uh, monorail or automated people mover and a tr tram trolley streetcar option. Next slide, please. And then a few other options we've also evaluated just to make sure we're looking at the complete list here is a personal rapid transit, either on the ground or an elevated system, a gondola, hyperloop, and a string rail. Next slide, please. Um, let's, let's just skip to the next one. So we, I'll just show you what, what the analysis shows here. So we, um, through the screening, uh, the, it was, um, shown in your packet, the various different screening metrics we evaluated and the results of all the different alternatives that we evaluated. So what we came down to in the screening is that the top seven alternatives that, that uh, came to the top are listed here. And then the alternatives in bold are the ones that uh, the project team is recommending to move forward into the more quantitative analysis. And of those, there's um, a list them here, the commuter rail, electric commuter rail, an electric light rail, uh, and the bus rapid transit system, as well as the autonomous road train. And again, that's actually rubber tires on pavement. Uh, the next slide, please. So just a little bit of details about the electric commuter rail. Um, it did show that it has um, reliable travel times, strong ridership potential. It is does support transit-oriented development, which would be, would be important for this um, transit facility. Um, and level boarding is really came up a lot in our stakeholder input, the importance of people being able to independently access um, the to get on the, the transit vehicle with their mobility devices, as well as with bicycles and, and plenty of space for bicycles. And, and this option could commingle with freight in a shared use corridor. Next slide, please. Also, we'd like to move forward the electric light rail option. It also has a strong ridership potential. Um, travel time would be uh, reliable. It's supportive of the greenhouse gas reduction goals. It also supports transit-oriented development. And this would be compatible with freight rail if it's, as long as it's temporarily separated. These vehicles are typically lighter and are not FRA compliant. Next slide, please. The rubber wheeled options that we're uh, considering moving forward is the bus rapid transit option. Um, this has less capital cost compared to some of the other modes. It also has the ability to have level boarding, at least in areas along where it could um, be utilized along the rail corridor. The, the thought behind the bus rapid transit system is take advantage of the flexibility of a rubber wheeled vehicle and that it could be on the rail corridor for certain lengths of the corridor, but it could also operate on the roadway. So for the level boarding, um, it could be have level boarding on the rail right of way, but that would not likely exist for the areas where the bus rapid transit would be on the local roadway network. There's also a possibility of, um, just going back to the uh, bus rapid transit for a minute here, there's also the possibility of um, transit-oriented development as long as it looked at, at, was looked at as a uh, permanent system. And uh, for the autonomous road train, there it also has strong ridership potential. This isn't a system that has been out in many places. We've only seen it in China at this point, but there, it, the HDR uh, team feels strongly that this is a type of system that's going to become more and more um, examples of it out of, along the you know, global as well as national. Um, because of some of the technology benefits of a system like this. Um, again, would likely um, support transit-oriented development because it would be a permanent system. Um, also support greenhouse gas reduction goals. Next slide, please. So with that, next steps. Um, 
We are, like I mentioned, we are planning to bring this to RTC for approval on our June 4th meeting and um, work over the summer to develop, do work on the quantitative analysis and bring in the fall to RTC, a locally preferred alternative based on the quantitative performance measure results and uh, planning for a January 2021 business plan to be presented for um, this, whatever locally preferred alternative is chosen. And with that, I'd be happy to open it up for questions. Um, we do have, um, besides myself on the project team, obviously the Metro staff, as well as uh, Guy Preston, who uh, executive director at the RTC and um, Luis Mendez may be able to join us. I know he had a commitment up until 11. Brianna Goodman, also a transportation planner. Uh, so if there's any questions you want to uh, direct in any of those directions, just wanted to let you know who's on the phone. Thank you. I, I have some questions, but let me ask if there are others first from the board who have questions or comments. Aurelio. Yeah, my, mine's just a real quick, simple question. You said one of the uh, alternatives was not uh, FRA compliant. What makes it not compliant? The, the weight of the vehicle, and it just means that it can't run at the same time as a freight vehicle. So um, for a commuter rail, typically those vehicles are heavier and they are, are FA, FRA compliant. And so that a freight vehicle can um, commingle at the same time, essentially, you know, one, the train, the passenger rail could get onto the siding and the freight could pass it by. Uh, for the light rail system, it would you would need to have a different time frame. So the freight would have to be at a different time than the passenger rail service. Considerations that the light vehicle would be obliterated by a heavy freight train. So you want the train to at least have some substance to it so it doesn't collapse like an accordion if it gets hit. Yeah. And, then, you know, my concern was that if it, it was required to have a separate uh, rail line for service for that. Well, it wouldn't be necessarily separate. I mean, there would be sidings uh, would be the way it would be dealt with, you know, for, not for the whole length of the track, but for the various places where they, but again, she says maybe the freight would only run in the evening or at certain times of the day when the other trains were not, the other vehicles were not on the, uh, in the, in the corridor. Well, thank you. Other questions or comments? John Leopold. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, and if there's going to be passenger service or freight service, there's going to have to be some kind of transit control. I for, uh, I'm forgetting at the moment what exactly it's called. Uh, but uh, after a series of crashes on the East Coast, I think all new systems require that uh, a, a system where uh, you can actually track where the freight is, where the passengers, or where all the trains on the systems are. I know that they have that up on the smart train. Uh, I'm going to call on myself. So I have a, a actual large issue here that I wanted to raise about two things. We were, uh, there's a little committee that was appointed that has three members from uh, Metro and three members from RTC, although there's overlap, uh, that's sort of been looking at these issues. I'm part of that committee. Um, and we've sort of gone through these things and looked at them. But the, we, at that meeting, we were told that there would be um, more description of how the letters A, B, and C were awarded for the variety of categories that we're looking at. That actually, as far as I can tell, hasn't been presented to us in any significant way. In other words, there's the judge, it's a qualitative judgment being made by the consultants, I think with our staff um, and RTC staff involved in the process. But I, I'm, I'm still not clear why some of these A, B, and Cs were uh, awarded. I'm not sure the pro in the process here, because we're coming up on June very quickly, when we get a chance to sort of look at those. For example, when I look at the, let me start back at another level, actually. PRT or inverted PRT, maybe the maybe I'm too focused on the coronavirus and its you know effects on our world, but the idea that people, you know, might be able to ride in a system where they would basically be social distancing and that each little car or pod on the system is fairly attractive in the short term. You know, it wouldn't, this isn't going to be built in the next year or two, so that's not the issue. But in the long run, whether our future contains more need for that than perhaps we've thought about in the past. And also, in general, there's kind of a lot of people like their private cars because they don't, maybe this is not healthy, but it's the reality in America that people don't like riding on public transit or concerned many people are concerned about it because they don't like being in the sort of crowded situation, even if they've got their own seat and everything else. And I wonder to what extent 
Um, so it made me interested in the inverted PRT for that reason. And then once I got to that, I was, you don't want to do something that makes you know sense in that, on that abstract level, but when you get down to it, it's too expensive or it doesn't function or carry enough people or whatever. So when I started looking at some of the A, B, and C awards on, on inverted PRT, I started wondering whether, you know, why those were awarded they were they were. They were given C's or B's for things that I thought were some of the real virtues of um, of PRT, the, its ability to be fairly flexible. For example, when you come to Cabrillo, none of the four options we're looking at now could get off of that corridor, the, either the road autonomous road train or the either the rubber tire or the, the uh, on-track uh, vehicles. Whereas a PRT, it's not that expensive to run a spur off or to run off to Cabrillo or perhaps up to the university when you got to that end of the line. And I'm sort of wondering how this is my question is, when would we be able to have this discussion when we could look at the actual award of the A, Bs, and Cs and question, you know, the logic behind it or the, you know, again, it's qualitative, but what it was that made people award, the, uh, the consultants award those particular uh, values, A, B, and C, to the various uh, uh, criteria that we were looking at. I guess that's happy. a question for Ginger. Yeah, uh, I'm happy to answer that, Mike. Um, we did go back to the criteria that were used for each of the different metrics and make them um, have those provide much more information in them. And so I don't know if you had a chance to look at those. I like wasn't able to find those. I looked through the entire report that we got and maybe I wasn't looking in the right place. So I would just I mean, direct there's you there's to... A general, there's a general discussion of, you know, why of what the item means or like what it is that what it is that's being judged as the award of a b or c is given but the idea that this is the reason that we gave this a b for this particular thing is there's a document that tells us that because i didn't find that in the, and i was looking through all the material so in the packet for the metro meeting there was the tables of all of the evaluation the abc and if you look yeah, at the top one for, the, one for the economy one one for the for the whole triple line, for, you know, for the environment, the economy, the social justice, and the other, I think. Is that the document you're talking about? That's correct. And so if you look at the top, it has the criteria of what each of the, what A, B, and C uh, is referring to. So for an example, the capital cost, um, I think when we had the meeting last, we did not have actual numbers in there, but now it has, a capital cost per mile is less than uh, 20 million per mile. B is 20 to 40 million per mile, and C is greater than 40 million per mile. So we really try to give more detailed information about the criteria um, that's being evaluated here and what the ABC means. Um, and, and just to address some of the uh, personal rapid transit questions. We're fortunate to have HDR engineering have some experience with personal rapid transit. They're actually working right now on the Morgantown system. And um, they've related to us that it, the cost of the capital cost of that project has is uh, 560 million for three and a half miles. So it, it's the type of capital costs that are really kind of out of the ballpark for our system. It also has a lot of, um, it's just really an unknown. There's not a lot of examples of it being out there in the world to really um, you know, get some good information about how uh, viable it is and, and how it would be able to support the various different metrics that we're evaluating. It's just such an unknown technology. There's just not that many examples. Um, the elevation, you know, if we were going to go with an elevated system that has uh, obvious challenges with the visual impacts and the Coastal Commission. Um, and also the, the, some additional information that we've been learning is just the, the reality of when you, for any of these systems, um, that it needs to be two directional unless it can utilize the roadway system like a bus rapid transit. And so for a rail system, you can have sidings. And so you can still have a, a one lane, but a siding system to still be able to be, um, to fit into the, the right of way that we have for our rail corridor. If you go to a system like PRT, you need to have room for it in both directions. 
and uh, especially the, the WIS of PRT are um, very substantial at the stations because you need to have, provide um, the ability to turn those vehicles around at the stations and have room to park all of the individual vehicles. And some of the numbers we've seen are on the order of like 150 to 200 feet wide and um, a substantial area of the right of way for um, personal rapid transit. So I think with a lot of, you know, those, those um, various different ideas in mind, um, that's really why the personal rapid transit did not make it um, in the draft recommendation or what to evaluate on a more um, qualitative level or quantitative level, excuse me. Um, I mean, my understanding of what you're calling in, uh, or we're calling an inverted BRT is that it can use a siding as, as well as anything else. I mean, basically because they're individual cars, they get programmed to go where they're gonna go. Uh, that they could sort of sit by the side. They don't have to turn around in that sense that they can, um, they, they end up going both ways, but they don't have to be, they can run, effectively be running backwards, but you wouldn't know that from the from the car. Um, but I, I'm not sure what level of detail. My, my big question is, I know that we got a letter from um, Brett, I forget his last name, um, uh, to the Garrett. RTC. And Garrett, thank you. Garrett. And, uh, you know, they're sort of raising some of these questions about the award of these things. It made me start thinking about a lot of these issues. And I'm, I'm just wondering where in the process we would get a chance to have a full public discussion of this before we make a final decision in June at the RTC, because I think that's when we're going to decide to limit to four. I mean, my inclination, I don't know how much more it would cost to study a fifth option. I'm not proposing that the PRT replace one of the four that's in front of us, but how much that more it would cost to look at that, given the sort of changes in social distancing issues, at least for the foreseeable future. And I don't think this is our last virus, unfortunately. But Ginger, Ginger, my question is sort of what, where's the process where someone like Brett gets a chance to come in there and make his arguments and have it seriously considered by the RTC and, uh, you know, by the, at this point, this is our last meeting on this before it gets to the RTC. Well, it certainly he can always attend the meetings. We are going to have a public hearing at the June 4th meeting and he can, um, you know, lay out his um, information and what his concerns are. Um, again, I would refer you to the criteria that's at the top of these tables that I think it does provide some really good information about how this screening process, um, you know, how, how these various different alternatives were evaluated through the screening process. And, uh, you know, this is a high level analysis. We, we will be de delving into the short list of alternatives at a more, much more quantitative level. Um, but obviously, we, we, you know, our, our team takes direction from um, the RTC. So if you are wanting us to do something different, we're, we're happy to hear that. Thank you. I have one other question. Um, could you summarize for us what it was about the tram? Uh, it, it's a, a tram, trolley, streetcar option. Why that scored badly in this overall um, alternatives, uh, high-level alternatives assessment? I wouldn't necessarily say it scored badly. I think the issue is that tram, trolley, streetcar, the, the way the typical system is on a roadway system. They go for very short distances and they go very slow. And I think it's just a, a different type of system than what we would want for our rail corridor that is more of a 20 mile uh, length system. And um, I don't know if the, I'm pretty sure it was in the handout in the packet, the statement that said it, we we could still consider a streetcar type of vehicle, but it would need to go fast enough to uh, motivate people to ride that vehicle from Watsonville to Santa Cruz. And so, right. you know, we're kind of trying to, it, there's, it's a little challenging to try to categorize these various different rail systems because with newer technology, it all seems like they're kind of merging together and there's not the uh, distinct lines that there used to be. And so, um, 
you know, the idea is, well, what, what, what is the, how are we going to define the type of system what we want? And the, what the project team came up with was it has to be fast enough to travel between Watsonville and Santa Cruz. That's going to be faster than if people are sitting in the traffic of Highway 1. And a 25 sure. mile or less of a vehicle that travels 25 miles per hour or less is not going to meet that um, metric. And so if it, if it is a, a TIG M type of vehicle, hydrogen fuel cell that goes 30 miles per hour or more, that's you know in a streetcar classification, by all means that would still be considered in this analysis. Thank you, that's very helpful. Anybody else with any questions or comments at this point? Okay, well, at this point, we're being asked if we are uh, prepared to uh, make a recommendation to the RTC meeting on June 4th. Um, Mike, you probably want to ask we, for public comment. Thank you. I was just going to make clear that um, that's coming up. And, there was uh, one. Guy, up that Guy now. Has, are there, has his hand up. Guy, go ahead. Thank you. I don't see that hand. Okay, You're still I'm, muted, Guy. I'm, 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 I'm muted now. Um, Thank you, uh, uh, Metro Board and um, uh, Director Rodkin. Um, I wanted to make a couple comments about the PRP option that you had brought up. Um, you know, the, I, I'm going to speak to it there. It's accolades first. Um, I mean, Brett Garrett and yourself have made some really, really good comments about PRP and why it would be a really interesting system. Um, you're talking about the ability for social distancing, the ability to be in individual cars, um, have more accessibility that it would come at more frequent intervals and be able to go to where you want to go and stop to where you want to stop. Um, the problem with, with um, PRT on our line is, um, you know, if you're talking about an at-grade system, we have um, dozens of at-grade um, road crossings. So you're talking about um, frequent interruptions to the local road network if you're not an elevated system. So um, anybody who's looking at PRT seriously would be looking at an elevated system. And when you talk, start talking about an elevated system, you're talking about major visual impacts. You're talking about a very urban type of a system where you're, you're 20 to 30 feet up in the air, um, which, this rail line goes, um, you know, right behind people's homes. Um, these vehicles would be able to be very visible from people's backyards. You'd be able to see into their backyards. You're also talking about with an elevated system about 10 times the cost of what an at-grade system would be. So using the figure that was provided for Morgantown, um, we're talking about $160 million a mile. Um, or about a $3.2 billion system for the, um, for the full length. So um, th there's great benefits to a PRT. And if you have all the money in the world and you want to build a system like that, and, and the community has the stomach for a very urban type system to be built in their backyards, it would be a great system. But considering the really, really high cost and the proximity to, to neighborhoods, it's really not a realistic alternative to be moving forward with. Um, and then I wanted to also mention a little bit about um, the question on the tram trolley streetcar, because it was actually a question that I had too. Um, you may know that we have been trying to get a, um, a company out here um, called TIG M um, that produces what has been referred to as a trolley um, to run a hydroelectric battery. Um, uh, cell vehicle on our line. It's very quiet. It's uh, very clean, um, but it was kind of characterized as a trolley. I met with these individuals and I asked them, you know, do these things only go 20, 25 miles an hour? How fast can they actually go? Because if you're only talking about those speeds, you're talking about, you know, an hour, hour and a half ride from Watsonville to Santa Cruz. That's not going to be very attractive. They've informed me that those vehicles can go up to 50 miles an hour. So if you look at the way we've moved forward with the EMU light rail alternative, we put a speed in there rather than, you know, a designation that a streetcar 
um, would not qualify for. So we're not trying to select the actual vehicle at this time, but we provided more parameters that these things would not require an overhead catenary system. It could be a lighter rail in the TIG M hydroelectric battery cell vehicle would actually qualify for. And um, that is really something that's included in the EMU light rail option. So I just wanted to provide that additional insight for, uh, for your consideration. Thanks, that's very helpful. I do have a question. The Morgantown systems uh, is a on the ground system. It's not an elevated system. So I'm not clear how the cost of an elevated system gets uh, extrapolated out of the Morgantown experience. Guy or Ginger? Unmute. You're, you're still muted, both of you. Okay, I didn't know how to uh, unmute myself. I didn't know that I had been remuted. Um, I wasn't uh, particularly familiar with the Morgantown number. I just took that number and extrapolated. But my experience is that um, from, from my work uh, with structures for both Caltrans and for high-speed rail, that an elevated system is about 10 times the cost of uh, an upgrade system. Okay. I, I was particularly moved by your the visual impacts because that certainly impacted our last look at a PRT system in the city of Santa Cruz when a lot of public uh, reaction against it, and that's certainly a factor to be considered. Are there members of the public who'd like to comment on this issue that's in front of us? The alternative for the and the process and the selection of these uh, four uh, choices out of the many possibilities is what's uh, in front of us for a possible vote here in a moment. Not seeing any. Okay. Okay. And we're, we're just looking, looking for input on this item. No, no. Not action. a vote. Okay. Not a vote. Thank you. That's very helpful. And again, last chance. Anybody else like to make any comments here about this issue? Okay. Um, this is an important decision. It's gonna affect us for the next 40 years or something once we finally get to it. And uh, it's important to trend and likely whatever selected the, the Metro is gonna probably run the system, my guess, whatever it is. So it's very important to us to understand what our options are and what the choice is gonna be in the end. I wanna also say I'm very pleased so far with the cooperation between Metro staff and RTC staff on this whole process. It's, it's important that we work on this together and not find ourselves in a fight with each other over it. So far, it's been quite a good process, I think. Anybody else? Okay, we're done with that item. Thank um, you. We, sorry, what? Okay, we're on to item now number um, 17. Yes, Mr. Which Chair. Which is uh, Pacific an update that comes from Alex Clifford. Sure, Mr. Chair, just briefly, um, I would hope to bring you an MOU at your June meeting. Um, we've completed the process of uh, uh, negotiating that with the city. They're now taking it through their process. Uh, as you can imagine, the city, like us, uh, are, are uh, challenged by COVID and, and all of the fiscal crisis that comes with that. My understanding is they, they have, uh, earlier this week, uh, had that discussion in closed session. So I would hope to hear very soon about uh, hopefully their approval of that MOU. Um, likely that MOU still has to clear the hurdle of their their uh, council. Um, I will tell you, uh, Julie and I worked in collaboration uh, in such a way that everything that we put forward in this draft MOU has already been concurred with by Julie. If their council comes back, uh, city council comes, uh, uh, city general council comes back with any substantive changes, then we'll still be back in a position likely of negotiating. Hopefully they'll buy off on it, not make any substantive changes, and we can bring it to you in a timely fashion at your June meeting. And that concludes my remarks, Mr. Chair. Okay, well, we're running kind of late into the day, and I, I was gonna ask for some highlights of that agreement, but I think we'll put that off, and perhaps you could give us some update about it uh, as we get closer to, the, to our uh, meeting that's coming up uh, sure. later. Absolutely. Anything else? Okay, we are then about to adjourn. We have completed all of our business. Thank you all, it's been, I think, a good process. Oh, I appreciate uh, everybody's- uh, Mr. Chair, what? you have uh, James yes. Sandoval with his hand up. Thank you, James. I don't have a picture, so I don't see it. You have to unmute yourself, James.
There you go. You're unmuted. Is this the time to speak uh, um, on items for closed session? I'm not going. There is no closed session for today. No closed session. Okay, got That's you. correct. Thank you. Otherwise, otherwise, it would be the time, but <laughs> we're not having a closed session. Our next regular meeting uh, probably still be, well, at this point, we're still we're saying it might be a real meeting. We don't know whether we'll be uh, able to meet in, in person, but people have to keep posted here on whether it's going to be a Zoom meeting or a meeting in uh, uh, actual uh, connection. And uh, that meeting is June 26, uh, 2020. And uh, as I said, uh, you have to check our website, and you could certainly call the district. Uh, I'd wait a week. We don't probably don't know anything for a week, but find out whether it's going to be an in-person meeting or whether it's still be a Zoom meeting. I'm going to put my money on Zoom meetings. Still, things are not changing that quickly, but we'll find out. Uh, Mike, I don't mean so, to interrupt you, uh, but there is an item on closed session. Did you guys remove it? Yeah, there's, there's no closed session. We canceled the closed session. We're not going to closed sessions. Gotcha. Okay. Whatever that item is, it'll be put off to the next meeting if there's still an item left. But we're not. There's no no further meeting after we adjourn. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. So we are adjourned. Thank you all very much. Everybody, stay safe. Mr. Chair, you have Mr. Yes. Henderson with his hand up. Mr. Henderson, comment. Hi. Uh, very quickly, uh, is there currently a framework or timeline as it relates to fair collection uh, and when that might be reinstated? Any uh, leading thoughts on that or still to be determined? Uh, yes, Mr. Mr. Chair, with your concurrence. Uh, yes, right now I'm, I'm uh, entertaining the concept of putting it back in place on June 1st. Um, that is uh, dependent primarily right now on the completion of the clear curtains that you saw earlier in my presentation. Um, remember the, the key reason why we went this direction was to reduce the potential dwell time of a customer within inches or within a foot of the bus operator to create more social distancing. Um, that curtain should replace that concern. If we get those curtains installed and, and James comes back to me with a, a good report about how they're functioning and concurrence that they agree we should put fares back in, uh, we're looking at June 1 right now, tentatively. That's pretty Very scary. good, thank you. And Anything James has his on? James has his hand up. James, go ahead. You have to unmute. There you go. That was a that was a mistake. I left it raised from the last time. And okay. yeah, I, I I've been talking with Alex about the fares, and it, it, it's definitely supported by the operators. Good. Thank you very much. And we are adjourned. Thank you all. I'm going to uh, leave the meeting myself, and I assume that the people in charge will close it down. Bye-bye, everybody. Hey, stay safe.